Hello, Silas here, and I'm back with my friend Steven. Steven, say what's up, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. And this is Dishing on Dish. This is a series that we do where we just talk about certain foods, certain restaurants, certain places that Stephen has been to and he tells us about it. And this is today we're talking about Dolly Varden. Please tell us a bit about this, Stephen. Sure. So this is a restaurant slash bar uh, down the street, actually, from where I live. I've been going coming here about a year or so now. It was interesting. It was actually... It was going to open shortly before the lockdown, but of course, because of the lockdown, things had to shut down. So I went and stayed with my family for about a year, and when I came back, it was opening up, which was pretty nice. I just sort of checked it out because it was a local neighborhood spot initially, and I was really impressed. I thought for a place that's basically like a casual bar and restaurant, the, the food is definitely above average. There's some very creative cocktails here. We'll get into the cocktails towards the end, but there's one that actually won a national award, which I thought was really cool. And I, I think this place is just kind of a hidden gem. It's one of these uh, little sort of underrated spots. That I think a lot of people pass by, but I think for what the place is trying to be, it does an excellent job. Yeah, and this is part of the You Are What You Consume series. Um, I got to know Steven back in 2017 when I was in New York City. And um, we just started this conversation before, we were talking sorry, about. Sorry, I think it was before, actually, because I remember it was before Trump ran, because I remember you were talking about a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. and then, yeah. Okay. Then, then it, it, yeah. Uh. When did I move to New York then? No, because, yeah, 2017 was, like, the last year I was there. 2014, I think that, 2014, 2015, around there. Yeah. 2014 yeah. was San Francisco. Anyway, <laughs> so we, we got to know each other, and he's been in the food service industry for some time. When I met him, he was still working at different restaurants. He was still going through managing and closing them down. <laughs> We've talked about that in separate videos. But the you are where you consume was just a general thing of you are what you consume in, like, the foods that you take in physically, the fats, the carbohydrates, the proteins build up who you are. So we talked about different things to do with food. We talked about the French laundry, about, like, chowder, chowder, how it came to be, how many recipes come to be. But with Dish on Dish, it's like a subsection with that, where Stephen has been taking his time going out to different restaurants, places that he worked, and he just has a lot of knowledge about it. He's... Um, He's, 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 what was the word? Okay, he's human foie gras, because every time there's foie gras, he'll go into that. But there's like, well, a gourmand. He's a gourmand of sorts. I think he's he's really familiar with it. And the cool thing about Stephen is not just the food itself, but I really like the background insight that he has on it and like how restaurants work and how it's come to be. And he's been living in New York. He's a New Yorker. So he knows the things in the restaurant capital of um, of the world. Now, with Dolly Varden, as he mentioned, one of the cool things about this restaurant is, unfortunately, there's a lot of places that closed during the whole pestilence from um, accepted origin to be in some laboratory somewhere, <laughs> possibly, chances. Um, <laughs> that happened, and that closed down a lot of places in New York City. Definitely the work that, uh, the place that Stephen was working, that was shut down, and we had different conversations talking about that. But this is kind of cool to see a place that actually opened after that and is starting out after that. And um, we actually had a bit of a of a hiccup with this. We've done, we've been doing this series. We have, how many how many restaurants have we done? Eight? Eight? No, just, Eight eight, 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 somewhere around there. I'd have to go back and look, but yeah, somewhere around there. Uh. Yeah, we've done eight or nine restaurants, that, uh, eight different restaurants that we did, like maybe the, the one specific one where we did on burgers, but some of those are in multiple parts. Like this is going to be at least a three-part series. We're going to talk about the foods in two parts and then a big one on cocktails because a lot of interesting cocktails in this. It's going to be a bit of a difference with this one is unfortunately some issues with Skype as we're downloading this known issue with the actual thing where the file that we did the initial recording didn't uh, get uploaded. So we'll just go back through some of these. So it might, we might do, 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 do yeah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we might do some callbacks to certain things, we'll mention certain things, but um, let's just see how it goes as it goes, as we go with this. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this from the Dolly Varden website. It says this, the inspiration. Creatively inspired by New York City's Gilded Age through the Roaring Twenties Jazz Age, Dolly Varden serves creative cocktails and elevated menus in Hell's Kitchens. The name Dolly Varden has always been a symbol of feisty endurance. Long before influencers, Dolly Varden was a cultural phenomenon inspiring fashion, theater, song, art, and commerce, conceptually based um, on the eponymous coquette concocted by Mr. Charles Dickens decades earlier. As another enduring symbol, Dolly Varden was also the name of the last passenger train locomotive to run up the west side of Manhattan, just blocks away. So with this, we normally do the first part, we 
talk a bit about the restaurant and then if there's multiple other parts we won't go as much into it but i open up with talking asking questions about the place and the content of the place and then we just talk about the cookbooks and things like that so to start off with can you tell us a bit more about the location the tables the number of tables in there and the ambiance inside sure so it's it's located near me in hell's kitchen it's 51st street it's few blocks from Times Square, if you picture where Times Square is, it would be basically northwest, a few blocks up and over. Uh, we They get a lot of the theater crowd, as you can imagine, because this is one of those places people will go to before seeing Broadway shows and so on. As Silas mentioned, there's a tram car outside, which is actually an outdoor dining area. It's really nice, and it started during COVID because of the outdoor dining requirements, but it became kind of popular because people just like sitting outside. It's nice. It's enclosed. It's well-decorated. It's kind of creative. Even in the rain, I've seen people sit outside, and it becomes because it's insulated enough and they carry your stuff out but keep it covered so it's a little annoying for the staff but it's a nice experience uh they have a few <laughs> small they have a few small outdoor tables as well um only only like maybe like three or four small ones and then the place actually has two bars and two um two bars and like two dining areas there's a downstairs area which has a few high top tables and in the back there's maybe five or six four tops then upstairs there's another bar there's a small private room with that's like i think like up to 10 or 12 people and then there's a few other tables that are either two tops or four tops i'm not sure how many tables off the top of my head i mean if i had to eyeball it maybe hmm i mean there's the two bars there's maybe what three high tops five maybe like 12 15 ta standalone tables if i had to guess and then mm -hmm. um the bar the bars are probably into the teens. Again, I don't have an exact count off the top of my head, but you figure also, because it's a bar, again, people don't sit there all night. You're going to turn those tables a bunch of times. They're to the tables and the bar seats. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and definitely check out. There's a lot of pictures online. It's definitely one of those very uh, social media-able, Instagrammable, Instagrammable uh, kind of locations. It's uh, kind of, it's, I don't want to say hip. Hip is kind of an overused term, but there's a lot of good images on the website. There should be, if you're watching the video version of this, I'll have something on the screen. You can check it out, but you can go check it for yourself and see what's what's on there, what's available. The, 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 the street car, I'm hoping, I still haven't double checked to see if that car is actually uh, modeled towards the last like um, tram that actually was running up. I think they would. We. I mean, there'd be no point for you to actually put a tram and go into the actual effort of actually designing and putting that tram kind of look, knowing there was actually a tram there, writing it on your website that there's a tram there, and then not having the design actually be like that tram. That would seem to be like kind of like, why, what are you doing, Dolly Martin? Uh, but yeah. Um, so do you know anything about like the owners or the people who are running this place? Because some of the background knowledge that you know with these things. Um, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Actually, I meant, I think I mentioned last time, I know that the chef worked in Vietnam, I'm pretty sure. And you'll, we'll, as we get into the dishes, you'll see a lot of the themes, fish sauce. Um, there's, I, I forget if he uses tamarind, but some of those Southeast Asian ingredients, uh, micro cilantro and other things. I'm not, I'm not really too sure about the owners. I, I think I'd mentioned too last time the staff and the, the staff and the manager had changed since I first started coming there because what what happens at a lot of restaurants you'll notice is that when places is open there's a certain crew there's usually a certain chef and or manager and then some something will happen and they'll leave but then they'll have a certain crew that's loyal to them and then they all leave so then it's brand new staff so i think one of the problems with this is that it's the consistency dips a little bit and recently i've noticed they've just been running a lot of the same stuff on the menu and i think it's because of the change in staff because usually when the staff changes it's really hard to implement new things you just kind of run with what's going but i think new staff are getting settled in now and i, I was talking to them the other day and they're talking about the menu will change with spring and they also have some new spring cocktail ideas like lavender uh there's lavender cocktail um they're going to do something with liquid nitrogen. So I think they're getting settled in again where they can start doing new things. Now, who who owns the place? I'm not 100% sure. I can't really say. Uh, now, with this thing, do they – hmm. Do they know me get, will they know me like get rehired and say like if the manager leaves does he go to like a new restaurant and then he's like brings his crew in and boots out the people that are in there or do the people just kind of scatter to the wind and then find other places? Well, it, it's funny because it depends on the places. Like, for example, I worked in a place where the chef de cuisine, he was like the number two guy under the executive chef. He actually got fired. But the thing is, he had a big following. So what happened was he got a, a new uh, a new job at a, running another place. But what happened was that crew gradually left and joined him there because they preferred him mm -hmm. over the chef. So there's things like that. I, I actually 
The other day when I was in Dolly Varden, there was a guy who was there when I started. He came back to visit. I sort of said hi, and he explained, like, oh, um, that first manager left, and then, like, we kind of just went our separate ways. Like, I opened this place, this person would hear all that. So I think it just depends on the people, the circumstances, all that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, now I guess we can switch to the menu. And this is one thing, the menu has stayed the same. Uh, don't we talk about, tell us a bit about the menu. It's, I still remember some of the things from before. And the way this works is Stephen sends me a document with the images of the things that he's done. Then I go through, once we get into talking about the food, I'll just talk about the actual names of the food. And then he tells me more about it. But it's a really amazing menu. <laughs> like, definitely go check it out. I think it's to me, one of the positives I like going to restaurants is either getting things that I'm probably not going to make by myself because it's like too many ingredients for just regular cooking, like things like lasagna on my cooking. Chances are if I find a lasagna somewhere, I'm going to order that. Or I look for things that give me like brand new ideas off of things that I already make. I'm like, hmm, how are they going to do this in a different way? And just looking through the recipes, even before we actually got into looking at the food, that really gave me many ideas. I mean, looking at the menu themselves and the menu's, the menu's really good. There's a lunch menu, a brunch menu, a dinner menu. So can you tell us a bit about these menus? Sure. So they're, they're open every day, lunch um, Monday through Friday, brunch is Saturday, Sunday, dinner, of course, every day. The um, brunch and lunch, you probably see some crossover certain items like sandwiches and things. That's pretty common. Like sometimes brunch, they'll have burger or chicken sandwich, and then lunch will do the same thing. Cocktails are available, all the meals. I've only actually been there for brunch once. I may come back. I often say I love breakfast food, but I'm not that hungry early in the day. So it's I, I want to come back and try their stuff, but only if I'm hungry during the middle of the day or so. I think la last time I went for brunch, it was like 3 o'clock. I think brunch runs till like 4 or so. So if I'm somewhat hungry in the middle of the day, I'll try it. I had the Eggs Benedict, which will be our first dish. But I do want to try the chicken and waffles. It's with um, jalapeno and stuff. Sounds pretty interesting. Dinner, I pretty much tried the whole menu. Like I say, one of my, one of my criticisms of, of the place is the menu has hasn't changed much, but I mean, if they're going through staff, I don't want to be too harsh on them because I, you know, having dealt with that myself, it's a transition. But I think as they get settled in and the seasons change, my my guess is that now they're probably working on some new items. So once they're settled in and they can start building, it'll be pretty good. Um, I mean, the food, the menu is great as it is, but at the same time, it, it's tougher for someone like me to come back over and over if I've tried all this stuff and it doesn't change because it's like I'm not going to order the same dishes over and over. Yeah. 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 And price range, we're talking about things like for, for lunch and brunch, you're having things like $13 is the cheapest one I'm seeing. We're at $13, $15 around the same area. Yeah. So about $21, $20, $21. For yeah. dinner, now you still have that $13 at the bottom. And then you, the highest one is uh, $30 to $30. Bucks. So it's it's pretty pretty good prices for uh, New York City. And yeah. I mean, some of y'all, you'll see once we get to the food, like, yeah, here, it's a bar. But I've never really seen a bar with food like this. And Stephen, you were saying this might be actually a new direction that uh, that the restaurant industry is going in, where it's like, hey, you, you don't really have an excuse. Like, oh, just because we're a bar, we're not going to have actually decent food. We're just going to have like some kind of stale kind of like peanuts <laughs> or, or just like the typical like just kind of burger. All right, it's just a burger you can get or some mac and cheese. So it's you've got to do a bit more to actually still get people to your place, right? Yeah, because what I was saying last time was its predecessor, House of Brews, which was in the same spot. They had an excellent beer selection. You can probably tell by the name, like long tap line on this. But the food is was basic bar food. It's like chicken tenders, buffalo wings, plain burger. Like it was very, very, very generic stuff, whereas this stuff is much more elevated. And excuse me. And what I was saying was um, I feel like as you're saying that that's going to become the new standard because it's like if you go to a place and that's all you get, like you're not going to get people keep, to keep coming back, especially when other places offer more interesting stuff. I mean, certain Irish bars get away with it, but it's places that usually have been around for, well, it's places that have been around for decades. They have people that have been coming there for decades. Like yeah. they're in a certain location where they have clientele. So there's no real reason for them to change. But if you're opening the new spot and you're trying to be established, you can't really just like the stuff that house of brews had and then expect to become popular off that. Cause I mean, you're not distinguished in any way. Uh, yeah. yeah. And with this one, we'll have, a, of course, a separate one where we talk about just the drinks itself. That'll be after we finish this up. And uh, we were talking about there's actually some change now with the drinks. That that's that seems to be a lot more seasonal than the actual food because it still is. That still is. It's one. Food is like a 1B type of thing. Or like maybe even a 2. You can say that. But so uh, we were kind of wondering, hey, are some of these drinks going together 
with the food where they're thinking, okay, this is going to go well with this food. So maybe the food is a staple, then they play with drinks around them in the season. But you come back to that last part, or it might be up already by the time you're listening to this. And in that last part, Stephen will be telling us about the different drinks, the different cocktails that he had, and the food he matched it with it and talked to us about that more. But this time, we're just going to be directly into the actual food. So what do you think was the challenge level of some of these recipes, some of these things that you were seeing in here? Like uh, one, for your example, like we talked about was the polenta fries. I'm just like, I'm definitely going to try something like that at home. But how many of these other things got you thinking like, oh, I haven't really tried that or oh, I'd like to try that myself and things like that? I mean, I mean, a lot of these dishes, I've made similar stuff in the past. I mean, this is probably some of this stuff may be intermediate level. I guess I don't know if that that itself may be kind of vague, but I mean, this isn't <laughs> this isn't like well, this isn't like the food at seasonal where it's definitely more involved and you need to work with special equipment. And there's very time temperature sensitive stuff. I mean, you know, it's it's there's more to this than just throwing wings into a fryer. But at the same time, it's like I think a lot of people could figure out how to make these dishes. I mean, you know, their wings recipes online. I mean, eggs Benedict, I've made a lot myself. Meatballs, I mean, people can make. But I think the what's good here is that the flavor pairings and even just what they put in are above average and something beyond just generic things. Like, again, I think House of Brews had meatballs, but it was just like tomato sauce and like plain meatballs. It's like, you know. I could probably make that way better myself for less money. So what's the point? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Well, speaking of the food, uh, let's just jump right in there now since we're here. And I think we've done it before. This is a bit, a bit of like a blah, 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 like blah, blah. Because I think, I think we had done a good job with coming back with that last one after taking a bit of a hiatus from recording. And just unfortunately, we had a hiccup with the, with the downloading. But some, some of these stuff will be more familiar, but we'll probably zoom through this a little faster than the normally one and a half hours that we do with these and then get into the next part. So that's the distance that we normally go for each part of these. But yeah, so the first dish here is some Eggs Benedict, which is... Herb hollandaise, thick cut bacon, home fries, and salad. So this is a classical brunch dish. Uh, there are all these conflicting stories about where it came from. There's one story about a business tycoon was hung over, so he went to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and asked for a dish that would cure it, and he suggested these items. There's a story about this couple with the last name Benedict. They were bored. There was nothing new on the brunch menu, so the chef came up with it on the fly. There's another – there's Delmonico, which was the first restaurant in New York City. They say they invented – I mean, there's all these competing stories, but either way, this is a classical brunch dish, typically the poached egg, usually Canadian Brit bacon, and then hollandaise sauce. And you can see here the differences are the hollandaise is flavored with herbs. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's fiend's herbs, which for those who don't know, that's the French um, parsley, chervil, and tarragon, and chives. And so I think I think that's in there based on how it tasted, but I'm not 100% sure. It looks like a little bit of espalette pepper on top as well. Uh, again, instead of Canadian bacon, it's thick-cut bacon, which is smoked. Very nice. I like to hear the home fries. They put in mushrooms in them, which is a nice touch. I mean, I love mushrooms personally. And the salad is nice. I mean, it looks like a mescaline mix with some um, radishes just make it look a little nicer. Yes. Yeah. Now with this one, I mean, most definitely adding mushrooms to pretty much everything. As that's, that's a favorite for us here. I mean, okay, the foie gras for Steven, of course. But then cheese and mushrooms are things that we are always a fan of. <laughs> They're no, it's... pretty much any dish that we that we see here. Now, one thing we were wondering was we talked about the eggs Benedict. We, some of these dishes we like kind of breaking down and say, okay, what are the basics to make the dish? Like in order for this to be this, what are the base things? Like when you're talking about we talked about lasagna before, and it's like the it can be any sort of thing, but it's like some kind of cream, some kind of like proteinish thing then a layer type of thing, then cream, proteinish, a layer type of thing, and that's it. Those, those, you, you need at least two layers or two sections of that and that kind of layer thing. Now you can add different kind of layers between those, but those three things have to be there in the double ways and baked in a certain way. So you can do all sorts of different things around that. With Eggs Benedict, we were thinking, okay, it's the poached egg. You have to have a poached egg. It could be any kind of egg. It could be an ostrich egg. It could be quail eggs if you want to poach a little tiny quail eggs or something. Uh, then it's some kind of sauce, some kind of protein, protein and we're thinking we think the english biscuit has to be a thing i don't think you could just throw in any other kind of toast or any other kind of bread i think the english biscuit or english muffin whatever you want to call it i think that has to be key thing but now with stephen being human foie gras we had thought maybe you can have like some raspberry vinaigrette type of thing or yeah some raspberry type of swedish or, or we talked with ed and he said cranberry like cranberry type of sauce so 
what other can you tell us a bit of the other kind of eggs Benedict you've had and also y'all listening think about other sorts of eggs Benedict you had of things that you would try to do it well I mean there, there's there's so much you could do because like as you're getting at I mean the the bread the egg and then the sauce you could tweak a little bit and then do substitute the protein so like there's eggs Neptune which is crab instead of the bacon there's uh, eggs Florentine which is instead of the bacon it's spinach or sometimes it with spinach in addition to bacon there was one with the blood sausage I thought that was kind of interesting there's there's um, eggs Mornay Mornay for those who don't know it's a bechamel based sauce that's used in mac and cheese there's that instead of hollandaise there's um, Trying to think what else. Oh, there's ones with uh, there's ones with sam smoked salmon instead. I mean, there's a lot you could do. I mean, again, if you have protein, this egg and a sauce, I mean, you could swap it out to different hollandaise derivatives, and so on. And what I was saying though with foie is because foie itself is mostly made up of fat. Uh, hollandaise doesn't make a lot of sense because hollandaise yeah. is based off egg and butter, so just fat on fat. Like you wouldn't get a piece of cheese, put butter on it, knead it. It's just too much. It's like you know you want. Wouldn't you though? <laughs> 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 you, but you, you typically any foie dish there's something that's sweet acidic some combination because you want something that contrasts the fattiness that kind of cuts through it and so you still taste the foie itself but there's something to sort of cut through it it's not just like fat on fat so what we were saying was raspberry or also cranberries because cranberries have a sweet but also sort of um sour element which i think goes well with the foie yeah because i'm thinking like some nice like maybe like grilled halloumi and you get yeah. like some frozen butter and some really thin slices and maybe you sprinkle like some fresh herbs on it and then you just put it on there. You kind of eat it immediately. So like the the, the kind of cold frozenness of the ice, of the butter is still there where it kind of tastes like ice cream. And then you have the warm crispiness of the halloumi and then the herbs. Hey, can, you can, <laughs> we can do something. You give me ideas with that. Now with eggs, Benedict, that's a simple one. But we talked about this here in the last step. But, it's simple to say, okay, we know this is eggs Benedict, or at least it's relatively simple. Oh, we've talked about the burgers and the burger series. Definitely check out the one of the burgers. We're talking about all these different kinds of takes on burgers. But when it comes down to salad, what is a salad? What does it account for a salad? How many different kinds of vegetables do you have to be? Because I think if it's just like two vegetables, you'd normally probably say, like, you wouldn't say, like, okay, peas are legumes, so it's not necessarily the same, but peas and carrots, you don't say it's a salad because it's like two things, two things. You'll say the two things. When you say like mixed veg, it's like it could be a mix of vegetables because I think you go to multiple ones. So with a salad, we don't know if it has a history with back in the day where you just didn't have that fresh vegetable. So there was like you'd have to like uh, pickle them or at least keep them in some kind of way to keep them relatively freshy so you can eat them. So maybe salad started with vinaigrettes and things like that. Then there's like it's a mix of different kind of vegetables. But we were thinking at least maybe three different vegetables, even if it's like three different kinds of lettuce. But it's like... Three, three different kinds, could be two different lettuce leaves and then like onions. And you can say maybe you started a salad that you couldn't just have like two things, I think. I don't know. What do you think? Well, well, when I was reading the etymology of the word, it comes from the Latin uh, herba salata, which basically means salted herbs or greens. And basically what it is is because originally greens wouldn't last, especially back then. There was no refrigeration, so they would brine the greens to basically make them last. That was it, but then yeah. they. But then, but then they figured out like, okay, if we if we have the greens but keep that brine, which later became vinaigrette separate, we can just add that last minute. So the greens stay fresh and crisp, but you still get the flavor of the vinaigrette. And the history was that like Romans, Greeks, Persians, Indians, whoever, they all seem to eat some kind of mixed greens with a type of dressing somehow. It was different, um, different things, usually oil and vinegar based. So it's one of those like who really invented it, we're not sure. But Basically, just a mix of lettuce, usually one or more items thrown in as well, usually originally vinaigrette, but then, of course, later it became dairy-based things and so on. My sense is that probably as refrigeration emerged, okay, you can make a buttermilk dressing because it'll stay fresh and you just put that mm -hmm. on instead. Yeah, Yeah, and you could also try – you could you get vegetables to people's place, so you didn't, necessarily, ah, you didn't necessarily have to brine them or pickle them or anything. People really miss uh, – a lot of people take things for granted. They don't understand how much simple technology, ability to travel to. I mean, people are so used to just on-demand things. People are so used to just living. I think most of this is more so in urban areas where you just have things in a walking distance away, pretty much everything that you might need. You just take that for granted. Yet, I think when you're more in a rural area, you realize that, hey, sometimes I need something and it's nowhere close to me. I could drive for hours and not find this thing. And people don't understand that some of these things most of us, if you listen to this, you live better than kings did even a hundred yeah. years ago. And 
and that's just for peasants. <laughs> that's us yeah. peasants are living and eating better. And you'll see some of the food that we have here. This is something Stephen just went. Stephen's a, he's, he's a rather regal man in himself. He's a, he's a cool guy, but he's not a king. <laughs> I'm in Kenya. I'm not a Nigerian prince, but I can still get some of these dishes just because of yeah. the, the benefits of living in current timeline. It's something that I'm very thankful to to have. And yeah. All right. Yeah, and, so, and, and, um, I've, and the thing is, too, the older chefs I've known, they've said how how much better New York City dining has gotten, especially in the last 30 years. And even people mm -hmm. in the industry, I remember there was a chef in school from Germany. He was a certified master chef. He said, you guys are more talented than I was at your age. And that shows how the industry oh, wow. has progressed. Yeah, because even because the knowledge and the skills that have developed, it's that even like a new person is better now than someone who was about that age decades ago, just because the industry keeps progressing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's true. and all the people out there say, "Oh, I can't cook, I can't do this." Yeah. Stop that! I mean, take some time. There's so many resources where you can find these things. Even some of these where they might not have a cookbook, but check your favorite restaurant that you've been to might have a cookbook. The chef there might have a cookbook. If they don't have a cookbook, there's other people who've seen that dish and then they can write down the recipes. There's tons of resources. There's like videos that show you step by step, literally show you you can just do it exactly like they do it and do it. Even getting places like HelloFresh and those delivery places, that's a good way to kind of start training and testing yourself because you get the prepackaged thing, you get it cut, you see how the cuts are supposed to be, put the things in there. Then maybe once in a while, like, okay, it's come with this package of the spices, let me add a different spice. Or if it's supposed to be a chicken dish, let me go out and buy maybe some lamb and then see what happens when I switch in lamb instead of chicken on the same kind of dish. And you can learn and you can train yourself to kind of just become more used to, more familiar being in the kitchen. Now that's just for your personal ability. You don't want to be able to starve with a pantry full of food, but also I think it will give you better appreciation for when you go to restaurants and when you go to other places and you actually see what the people are doing out there. And I think it's just a positive thing to just have that kind of knowledge. It's it's really, I get that you don't have to cook anymore, but I think that whole idea that saying I can't cook, I'll never be able to, that's something I don't really buy anymore. Well, I've probably said it before, but I remember a friend in culinary school was talking about this as well. It's a whole like, I don't have time to work out thing. No, unless, I mean, unless you have work 80 hours a week, have a family or whatever, it's like, you probably do have time. You're just not making time. If you could spend hours binging Netflix, you can find time, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever for exercise. Same thing with cooking. Like you can learn how to make a simple dish here and there. And then over time, do more involved stuff as you develop the skills. It's just, you don't want to prioritize your time to do that. No. Yeah. You can work out well watching Netflix, and then you'll be like the far right who have a penchant for home <laughs> exercise. <laughs> okay, oh, we'll go to the next one. We have <laughs> so focaccia and smoked tomato butter, and focaccia with rosemary butter. Sure. So I posted. There's two focaccias here. There's one with um, yeah, the one with. Smoked tomato butter, the other rosemary butter. The smoked tomato butter is back, actually. I saw it on the menu the other day. I preferred the smoked tomato butter personally. Rosemary butter on its own was okay, but the thing is, the focaccia already has rosemary on it, so it's kind of redundant. Like, it's just, like, rosemary and rosemary. I mean, it would be good on, like, a steak or something, but I don't know. I just thought it was kind of boring. My, I'm wondering if maybe they were trying different things or changing or what accordingly. But the mm -hmm. smoked tomato is nice. I mean, you know, you get the flavors of both, the smokiness, but also you taste the vegetable as well. Uh, again, I apologize for the difference in the quality of the photos. I had mentioned in our last recording that I took some of these actually on my old phone, which is an iPhone 8, and I took the newer ones on an iPhone 13. So because, you know, I jumped up a few steps, the quality of photos is a lot better. But I've also gotten more conscientious about lighting and other things too. So if you see a little variation in the photos, that's why. Again, I apologize. But I've, I've been coming here for over a year, and I didn't want to exclude all the older photos just because of that either. Yep. Yeah. Now with these butters, uh, I think I, one of the common one people must have is garlic butter when you're getting like pizzas or things like this, mm. or of course uh, honey butter. I think you have Cracker Barrel. The certain restaurants will have honey butter as a regular thing, serving with the bread, of course. Now, when you do these butters, how do they do? Is it normally in the churning process when they infuse these things? Like with this one, we were thinking maybe it was like they could have been like uh, somehow gotten a condensation of the smoked tomatoes and then gotten like the drippings from it and put it into the butter. But you said there's also pieces of it because I'm wondering, I'd like to probably try to make some of these at home, but I don't know. Is it during the churning process or is it a thing where maybe you can just get it to room temperature and then you fold stuff into it? Like, what do you think the process is for infusing these things? Well, I mean, the the term is compound butter, and I mean, I've made them in different places I've worked. Usually what it is is you soften butter to room temperature, you put them in a KitchenAid, usually a paddle attachment, and then mm -hmm. 
as the butter is churning, as it's being softened, that's when you throw things in and mixes together. And then, you know, again, like you say, you could do you could do garlic. Like I've seen what some places do is they garlic butters, you confit the garlic, so you cook it in oil, then you throw the oil and garlic into the butter, mix it together. Mm-hmm. Um, there is we talked about maize with dotel butter at Mineta Tavern. That's like uh parsley shallots a little bit of lemon juice all that you know but you can do a lot of different things i've seen the blueberry butter so you just add that and then you take it out and people do different things what some people do is they actually will roll the butter up into these little cylinder shapes and then slice it so for example if you notice in the container here the ramekins are these little circle shapes so what they do is well the one at the one in the top looks like it was just put in but the rosemary looks like it was sliced so what they do is you roll it up into a cylinder, cool it down. Then when you need it, you just slice one last minute and put it on the plate. So that way you have a nice little little, uh, circle on the plate. Again, I mean, it depends what you're doing in terms of presentation or other things. I've seen a lot of people do that with steak too. They'll put the circle on top. And then when you bring it out, you see the circle like gradually melting and you just mix it with your steak. Yeah. 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 One of the things I like looking at when I'm going through these restaurants and foods, and especially when you go to like the higher end restaurants, there's a lot of interest being put into how they plate it. Not just like the positioning of the food, but literally the physical plates, the physical flat where they put the things on. And, uh, you can see this is a kind of interesting little stubby kind of knife there that they bring out there. But just putting it on the board out there, it's there's, there's extra. I think there's definitely value added to this thing. And it's rather interesting to me to see that. And this is one thing that I've noticed with this restaurant. For As we said, this is just a bar. It's a bar with like the food kind of a secondary thing but they still have put in some extra effort to actually put in um, an identity there. You can be like, okay, this is Dolly Varn. I'm, just, I'm not just getting this on just like a white plate. Not that I mind white plates, but there's, there's extra thought being put into it and it's appreciated, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So also focaccia, by the way, for those who don't know, it's a bread from Liguria in Italy. That's in the northwest corner. It's just sort of it's picture the northwest corner of Italy. It's a part along the coast. It's it's one of those things that you've seen in other areas, too. But they say it's most associated with that region. It's a it's a it's 11 bread, but it's still kind of flat. Usually make it on a sheet pan, usually rosemary, a little bit of sea salt on top. Uh, I've seen ones with olives. You can do different things. I mean, um, the DB burger, if you remember, actually had uh, was a focaccia was focaccia bread, but it had cheese on it. So you could do things like that, like make the dough, but then make it into rolls, and then put some cheese over top last minute so it melts onto it. Uh, it's almost like cheese its or something, the flavor wise. Mm-hmm. You could do different. Th- you could you could do different things, but I mean that's broadly what the bread is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something that you could probably try out to make at home too. Some of these things, it's, it's a rather simple dish you can kind of make there. I think yeah. I think I've made focaccia in the past. I don't think it's that hard because, like I say, it's just leavening the dough, and then you need a sheet pan. And if you have like a big oven and a sheet pan, it's nice because then you just make this big like layer of it, and then you just cut it into pieces and serve. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now moving on to the next dish here, and this again is one of those where I think I would be okay with just. Uh, it's one of my favorites. One of my favorite things to to eat. And this is one of the things where I was thinking also like the whole idea of like just putting like cheese and butter. I think this is one thing I could probably just add some of it, but it, it's it's burrata. And this is um, burrata with pomodoro sauce, basil, pistachio pisto with house made focaccia. Sure. So this is so burrata for those who don't know, it's an Italian cow milk. Uh, usually sometimes water buffalo, depending, although that's less common in the States. Mostly water it's- buffalo. It should be. Yeah. It should, it yeah, should but be, as yeah. you mentioned, like in New York, there's going to be issues with the regulations, so you're probably not getting the yeah. full on like buffalo burrata. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure there are certain places. There may be certain places that serve it, but my guess is it's probably pricier, and it's probably like a whole import thing, and it's probably hard to get a hold of, sadly. But um, it's from Apulia. For those who don't know, that's the picture of the foot of Italy. That's the heel, basically. So it's definitely from the south. Um, it, it's, yeah, mozzarella and cream. The inside is softer. The outside, there's a little bit of a uh, skin on it. You break it open, it's nice and soft. Pomodoro just is it is the Italian word for tomato. Um, so basically just a tomato sauce. I mean, the, you know, you can make whatever you want with that. that like marinara typically has onions, garlic, uh, basil, things like that in it. Uh, so pisto is actually the Provence version of pesto. So for those who don't know, pesto, it's basil, olive oil, uh, garlic, and pine nuts. Now, this version is similar, but there's no pine nuts. Instead, what they did was they did uh, pistachios instead, which I thought was kind of a nice touch. Um, you know, give it a different flavor. On top, there's some fried basil, and then there's just some focaccia to eat it with. Really, really simple but nice. As you can see here, I uh, went with my friends Angela and Andrea, so we uh, we shared it together. It's pretty good. 
Uh, yeah, and as I told Sarah, this is not something I'd want to share, <laughs> share with myself. <laughs> and this is a, a really interesting presentation on it. In when you have this in Italy, like I got to Italy, and I was talking about the different versions of like Pokemon. You know, you have the first level Pokemon that you get, and then like let's say it's a Charizard, and then uh, it's like Charmander, and then it's Charizard. No, is it Charizard, Charmander, Charmeleon? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's Charmander, Charmeleon, Charizard, yeah. Okay, Charmander, Charmeleon, Charizard. So the Charmander is just like the string cheese, the, the mozzarella that you get in the States, which is still good. It's still good cheese. still like it with a block kind of mozzarella that you get. Then the Charmeleon version is just a buffalo mozzarella, which is just like a ball of just nice, soft, airy cheese. And then, like the Charizard version, is this buffalo? What's is this burrata? Because it has like the fresh cream into it, like strips, nice thick strips of of, of the mozzarella in it, and some salsa. Like when you open this, I can imagine it just kind of mixing in with the pomodoro sauce. When you get um, mozzarella or bu or burrata in Italy, the typical way to do it is uh, with prosciutto, and um, it's with black pepper. Um, uh, balsamic vinegar, like balsamic vinegar and olive oil. That's like the typical way they normally serve it to just have that as an aperitivo, as an appetizer. But it's another thing that we're thinking with people go to restaurants or go to places, sometimes they feel like, oh, I got to order like an appetizer. I got to order the main meal. I got to order a dessert. But no, sometimes you can just go and be like, I'm going to order an appetizer and a dessert because you can have this and this can count as pretty much a meal and then you won't really have too much space for something else. Feel free to do that. But I, th I think there's something where people feel like there's an etiquette. You have to order it in a certain way. You have to eat. Maybe sometimes you start with a dessert and then get the appetizer when other people are having dessert. Like ha it's it's your choice. Go out there to the restaurant and actually just eat and enjoy the food. And yeah. Well, at Mineta Tavern, I'm funny that way because the thing is that food's pretty rich. So sometimes I'll order an entree and I'll just have that by itself. But then if I'm still hungry, I'll order something else. But if it's like a filet mignon dish and the steak's like that big and then there's like a little side, it's not that much food. So then I'll order more. But I used to just order appetizer entree automatically, but then it ended up being too much food. So I just gauge it accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the people in the kitchen, they don't really get pissed because it's it, it, they make food on order anyway, right? Like it's not like they know I'm only serving one table because they might be serving you your entree while somebody else is getting their appetizer. So I think the order for cooking, it's not really going to like be a, is it a stress on the, on the people who are, who are waiting on the, on the table or what, what do you think? It depends. I mean, it depends on what you're doing. The problem is when people order a lot of stuff on the fly and the stuff that's on the fly will take a while because I've seen that mm -hmm. happen before where people will keep ordering new things or changing things last minute and they'll complain their food it takes too long, but it's like, from the kitchen's perspective, if you want something that just takes a while to make, you can't order it last minute. So okay. what a lot of a lot of servers will do, like I think we had talked about the souffle at Mineta Tavern, that takes I think like half an hour or something. You just tell people in advance. By the way, this takes half an hour. If you want to, if you want it, please let us know because it's going to be a wait otherwise. So if you what they recommend is ordering it with your entree or something, but then they gauge like, how are you doing? And then like, oh, would you be ready to fire the souffle? It'll take half an hour. Then you can sort of gauge like, okay, if I finish this food now, wait a little bit to recover, then the souffle comes out, it's good. But otherwise, if you wait and wait, it's just, I mean, they can't they can't rush things along. And uh, depending on who you deal with, I mean, I think a lot of people are reasonable, but occasionally you get that person who will order things last minute and expect it to be out immediately. And it's like, they're not, microwaving this stuff immediately and sending it out. I mean, these things take time to prepare, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Burrata, we're to say goodbye to that. At least one of my favorites is one of the channel or these conversation favorites is in this. There is unfortunately no foie gras at this place, but uh, Stephen, Stephen has made do. <laughs> you, uh -huh. can, you can find things to substitute for that. Now, we'll move on to the next dish here. We have some mushroom risotto with king mushrooms and a peppercorn sauce. Yeah, to to add on to, I wouldn't expect there to be foie gras here because it's a bar. Like, I would be impressed if they did, but it's like I wouldn't come here expecting it. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so risotto, for those who don't know, it's, it's a preparation of rice. You use a short grain rice, either arborio or carnaroli. Those are the preferred ones. Uh, now, you, work, you cook that with chicken stock usually, although you could do other liquids as well. The idea is that cooking the rice and working it actually causes the grains to break down. And the grains breaking down cause the starch to bleed out. And then you finish it with cream and butter and all that combined. It sort of thickens it and makes it a – you have these soft uh, gummy kernels of rice sort of in a – sitting in, I guess, a liquid, which is a, made up of starch and the uh, 
dairy products, whatever you add. So there's that. And then on top, there's the king trumpet mushrooms. I like a lot. Maybe we can put up a picture of them. Some people compare them to scallops texture wise when they're cooked. They're really nice. These are cut into pieces. Um, some celery leaves. Not sure what was in the peppercorn sauce exactly. Like there was a little bit of a kick to it, but I, I think it was just to give it a little bit of spice, not too much because I mean, risotto and mushrooms, it's like you wouldn't want a ton of spice. I mean, it's already a milder thing. Yeah, these are some rather cool looking mushrooms. I want to see if I can find them around here. I haven't seen them in any stores, but it might be some places I haven't looked yet. But yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to, to kind of cook with them. But yeah, with the pe black peppercorn, so because it's black pepper, pe peppercorn for y'all who don't know, it's just black pepper. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like peppercorn, so I don't know. This is probably they might have used a mix of it, but you can see some blackness in there. Yeah, I was kind of wondering, like, how do you make like a black pepper sauce? But maybe it's just like, yeah. I don't know, because normally when I'm, let's say I'm doing like a pasta. I'll, sometimes I'll use like the sauce from actually making the, the I mean the water from making the pasta. You can keep it also. You can refrigerate it for some time if you're not making it that day. But a lot of the starch comes out, and that's a good thing for making sauces and soups and things like that. So I'll normally sometimes even use the stock to make whatever sauce and soup or add it to the soup or sauce or whatever I'm having with the actual pasta itself instead of just using stuff on the side. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I was wondering maybe they just use some kind of stock and then they just put black pepper into it. But yeah, I'll, I'll look it up and see if there's kind of a thing. Because I like black pepper in my food, but I've never thought of, hey, just have a sauce with black pepper as the primary primary spice. I've never thought of that. You, you, usually it, for me, it's more of a finishing item because black pepper itself has a distinct flavor. So it's like, mm -hmm. unless you want the thing to taste like that, like there's the French classical au poivre sauce, which is a reduction with peppercorns in it. Um, you know, I remember a chef in school saying like, don't put black pepper in anything unless you want that thing to be prominent. Like, for example, I put it in, uh, well, like I put it in a hollandaise and he's like, don't do that unless you're selling it as black pepper hollandaise or something. Cause it just, it, it, it looks prominent and, it, and it's a, its own flavor. So it's like, you, you want to make sure it goes with something. Now I'm, I'm with Thomas Keller on this too. He says like, because pepper is very strong, you tend to use it with certain things. Like for example, red meat, like for me, steak, I pretty much always love that. Um, then like he has a raspberry sauce where he puts a little bit in just to give it a little bit of a kick so it's something besides sugar and some people will oh, put white interesting. yeah some people will put white pepper on fish i mean i'm not i don't like the taste of white pepper very much some people do it's it's the peppercorn but without the outer shell so it's not black i don't know white pepper to me tastes kind of funny i'm not really a big fan of it but i guess some people out there yeah, like I prefer it for so. the black to it yeah definitely prefer the black to the white yeah but again, the black also is a strong flavor and you see it on the plate. And the concern is that if you put it on things that it doesn't typically go with, it can look like it's dirty or like burnt or something. So that plus it's a contrasting flavor. So you got to be careful. Like, what are you doing? What are you using it for? Yeah. I think I might try this though. I might, I, this is a dish I might, I might try here myself. Of course, I'm probably, I'm probably not going to, I mean, of course, probably won't find, um, might not be able to find the king mushrooms, but I'm wondering if I can use maybe some paneer, use some paneer and some oyster mushrooms maybe, or um, yeah, or, or you could do something like that with this, because I've never tried to make risotto on my own. So I think I think this would be something I might, wouldn't mind trying, because I'm going to look out for that black pepper sauce and, and the peppercorn sauce and see what that's all about. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I learned how to make risotto in school, and I made it a little bit on my own. It's nice. I mean, it takes a little while, like, because you have to cook the rice, you have to... Um, you have to rinse the rice, you have to like par cook it a little bit. And then typically what they do in restaurants is they cook the rice most of the way and just finish it in the pot because it's like, you know, for the sake of time. Um, I know in some Italian restaurants, they actually cook it from start to finish to order. But the thing is that takes a while, but in Italy and some of these other, even high end restaurants here, it's a little different because if you're sitting down for a while, you don't mind waiting. But here, because mm -hmm. people want things in a timely manner, it's the same reason you cook pasta al dente. It's okay. The pasta is mostly cooked through. And then last minute you just heat it, you heat it up in the water, put it with the sauce and then it's ready to go. Cause it's like, people don't want to sit there and wait for it to cook. Yeah. yeah. In Italy, on a typical Italian restaurant in actual, a typical restaurant in Italy, when I say Italian restaurant, it's just, it's in Italy, so it's already Italian. <laughs> okay, so it's super, but okay, Italian food, because they could, there's other, there's like American, other kind of French restaurants also in Italy. So, but the typical restaurant you go there, when you're ordering a meal, it's normally like a three hour thing. You're just like, and you have just like the salad come out by itself, then like just some salumi will come out, so some prosciutto will come out by itself, then just the pasta, with maybe one other thing with a sauce, and then like the carne can come out, and then you can have like a dolcetto or something, and then you have like your um, limoncello or like some, or some cafe. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, and it's normally, 
it's normally like a big kind of talk. I haven't been to too many places that are just like this Italian place. And it's like a nice, quiet place. Like, no, it's like a communal type of happy type of jovial type of thing. There was one time I went with like some friends from couch surfing, which is a cool site. Even if you're not, this is one thing, if you're traveling around, even if you're not traveling around, if you live in a big city, even if you don't live in a big city, if you live somewhere in the United States of America and you'd like to meet new people without using like the social systems that are in there, one of the good things you can check is couch surfing because that's like people who travel around the world and go to different places. You can also sign up for couch surfing. They're not sponsoring this at all. But you can sign up and you can just say you want to meet for like a coffee and things like that. You can meet other people who are kind of in this community or traveling around. I think it's a good way to meet them. But anyway, so I met some people in the couch surfing community. You can imagine in Rome, there's a whole bunch of couch surfers. It's a very, very heavily visited place. And we went to a place that's on the outskirts of Rome. It's this kind of beautiful restaurant on this kind of hillside where there's a kind of like these steps, these long kind of steps of like these different wooden tables restaurants. It was like all the couch surfing groups of people just going through different tables, different kind of dishes are coming out. It was rather fantastical type of movie type of environment thing. But yeah, it's 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 interesting out there. Mm. That, that whole idea of like having a plate with like your greens and your meat and your protein and your starches, that's not a thing. Like it's no it's, a common thing. No, and, and that's the thing too. A lot of people forget, like, because people are used to spaghetti and meatballs here, but they forget that in Italy, pasta is something you eat before your entree. Like, for example, mm -hmm. I went with I went with my girlfriend to Babo the other day. If you look at the menu, it's like primi. Though it's like, what is it? Anti pasti. Uh, yeah, secondi. Primi, piatti. secondi, yeah, and then uh, dolce dessert. Yeah, but it's like you have like a list of appetizers, you have pasta, then you have your meat and fish, and then you have dessert, yeah. And yeah. that's not even like, as you're getting at, that's not even the full order, but like, it's something between what they do and what Americans are used to. So it's mm -hmm. like, um, at Babo, they also have a pasta tasting, which is interesting. I may do that at some point. They uh, they have a whole series of pasta courses, looks pretty cool. And I, I saw a couple next to me, not the other day, but not yet the other day, but a while back, actually do wine pairings, which is cool, wine pairing with each pasta course. Oh, cool. So yeah, so you start with like the lighter pastas, go to heavier, so it starts with like something light with like cheese in it, then you finish with like a beef, and then you start with like a lighter white wine, you finish with a heavy red. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Then at the end there's uh dessert of some kind and a dessert wine to go with it. I thought it was really nice. Yeah. How many people are you going? Like four, four or five tops? Like you can't really go with too many. But I guess you could have a very little wine. You don't really have to have that much pasta either. It could just be like a small kind of. Uh, well, well, that, that, like, that's that. That's how those tasting menus work in general. Like I remember it was the same thing at Felidia. Like for the chef tasting pasta course, it's like two or three pieces of ravioli. Okay, typically, yeah, it's, it's like yeah, yeah. Typically, it's like eight or something. But it's like, but because you're having that, then you have like a two ounce pour of wine, then another two ounce pour, and on and on. So by the time you're done, you have maybe 10, 12 ounces of wine each. So it's really not that much because you figure it's a little bit with each course. So yeah. yeah. All right. Now moving on to the next dish here. We have a chicken liver mousse, a topa brioche with sliced caper berries and olives. So this was actually a dish I had a while back, but I forgot to post. This was a special one day. It was really nice. It's a shame they're not doing it regularly, but I think it was just one of those things they were fooling around with. So you can see here the chicken liver atop the brioche. It was interesting the way it was piped out in kind of this zigzag pattern. Um, sliced caper berries, for those who don't know, those are brined. It's uh, They come from the same plant that you get capers themselves, which are the... Um, the bud of a flower before it's hatched. Um, there's some of the olives. I forget which ones these are called, the brown sort of purplish. I should know the name off the top of my head. I forget. And then there's some greens on top, some uh, celery leaf, and um, I think that's – is that amaranth or something? Yeah. It's really nice. And then toasted brioche on the bottom. Amaranth. Is that the name of that? Yeah, that's the name of that TikToker, isn't it? Not TikTok. Probably. <laughs> uh, Twitch, Twitch streamer, Twitch streamer, I think. Um, okay, um, yeah, I'm not a fan of olives. I've mentioned this before, but but I'm, I'm chicken liver is pretty good. Uh, just got some chicken liver. Going to try to do a liver pate and make it sound like with some bread and things like that. But yeah, with this mousse, these are the things we've talked about before. I just want to get some of these tools to try and make some of these kind of um, different takes on things. There's so many different things you can mousse as well. You don't have to just mousse the pate or the, the livers. But yeah, chicken liver, I saw you post this and someone was like, oh, that's kind of yeah. brave. And it's, it's odd to yeah. me because I'm just so used to growing up and eating these things maybe like i was born in france but my parents are kenyan so we can do the whole hog thing is a typical type of thing that we do like when my parents are growing up like they were as kids they were given like 
like when the when the family would have chicken, like the youngest of the kids would just have a chicken leg that's been boiled, like the actual leg with the with the claws and everything that would be boiled, and then they would just wrap some intestines around them, and they just that would be what they'd run off and eat and like enjoy that and get the meat off of that. So this whole idea of like giblets not coming out, getting a whole chicken in America, not even having like the gizzard or all those kind of things, and not even in the part. Like, where, what, is, what is this? So somebody had commented, was like, oh, that's brave. I'm like, liver is brave? Like, and he was like, oh, I don't like cow liver. Like, I like kidneys. And I, I've noticed that in America, you can't get some of these things because unfortunately, the way these animals are actually raised, like the amount of like, ant, like uh, antibacterial medicine and hormones and things like that, because the livers and the kidneys are supposed to clean the body out of this. So a lot of those things actually get trapped into it where they've said like it's actually unhealthy for people to eat. Yeah. So livers and kidneys, uh, the sweetbreads in certain animals, like these are things that I'm very familiar with. And I'm also just wondering, I don't, we've talked about you eat these. How, how did you come to eat these? Because they're not that common in first world developed countries. Okay, no, let me not say that. Let's see, in European countries, actually, it's more common. It's just not that common in America. Well, I've probably said this before, but a lot of it, it's, it's part of what you said about the stuff getting trapped in the organs, but it's also just we produce so much meat here that we can afford to throw it away. Like you probably heard that old expression high on the hog. That was because the rich people ate tenderloin and all that stuff. Whereas okay. the poor, the poor people had chitlins feet, other things. So the idea was, okay, we're rich. We're going to get our first pick of what we want. The poor people are just going to get what's left over. That's where that came from. But the thing is, we got to a point where, okay, we could produce all these steaks from all these cows and just throw away the other stuff. Cause people didn't like it. But then what ended up happening was, you know, again, all this stuff started getting wasted, but then certain chefs like Mario Batali, who, you know, opened Baba where I was the other day, he and others tried to start popularizing this stuff again because their idea was, look, you know, I mean, it used to be that we use the whole animal, not let things go to waste. Plus, as I said to my friend in that thread, there's a certain there's a certain craft and skill in working with these organ meats because they have very strong, unique flavors. I mean, you make yeah, filet yeah. mignon. So you good. make fil you make filet mignon taste great. I mean, well, everyone can do that. You make lobster taste great. Well, yeah, everyone can do that. But you make chicken liver, which has a distinct flavor. You season that the mm. right way, cook it the right way. And you can't have it raw, of course, or undercooked because of the liver, because chicken and salmonella. Like, there's a certain skill in getting that exactly right. So I think certain people are coming to appreciate that. And I remember it was Anthony Bourdain who talked about this, but also how people like Batali helped popularize this because he had a big following before his fall. And, but because of that, like people trusted him. They're like, okay, well, here's this talented chef that I like. Maybe I should trust him. And then people are like, hey, you know what? Maybe sweetbreads are good. Maybe lamb tongue is good. Maybe, and then, and then some of this stuff started coming back a little. I mean, I don't think the average person on the street is eating this stuff again, but I think it like a lot of people who will eat out regularly, um, you know, they're, they're fine getting sweetbreads and, t and um, certain people will get liver. Some people are a little wary about things like brain or whatever, but I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of get that too. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And with some of these, I guess they will also be probably be used in like dog foods or like animal feeds and things like that, yeah. or even probably like fertilizer. So I, I you know, I think it would just like toss them. But yeah, that was that's cool. No, like I like the etymology of things. Did not know that with like the high of high on the hog. But yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Interesting how some of these terms come to be. Uh, one of my favorite things. Um, I'll double check. I don't know. I I don't think I have this posted. But I have a food website. And, like I occasionally put food up there. It's like chefitup.carbon33.com. Put a link somewhere. Yeah, you can find a link somewhere somewhere around here. Um, one of my favorite things is goat livers, goat kidneys. You can get beef kidneys as well, but goat kidneys, I prefer with that. You slice them up, you cube them up, and you fry them uh, to get is, to get the full like crispy flavor on it and get to, to make sure they're well cooked. And after they're fried, you add uh, coconut cream or coconut milk, some onions, uh, some, um, what's it called, um, button mushrooms or any kind of mushrooms that you want. Even like the stronger tasty mushrooms can kind of be good with it. Or even like a shiitake or something, but you could find some strong kind of mushroom with it, or you no no actually in this case maybe not using such strong mushroom because you have a strong flavor already with the liver or the kidneys. So maybe if you have a more lighter mushroom, it's kind of just playing with some of the taste off of that and some chopped garlic. You can add a green fresh herb, cilantro or a parsley or what, a rosemary or whatever with it. But that's one of my favorite dishes. I've had it just with the ugali, which is a like kind of like whole meal type of thing. I've had it with rice, had it with pasta dishes. It's it's one of my favorite go-to things with uh, these kind of uh, like organ meats. So that's a suggestion out there. What's one of the good preparations you like for uh, organ meats? 
Besides four well, of course. <laughs> well, I, I, I like uh, I like beef liver. I've done liver and onions at home myself. Uh, Thomas Keller has a good section on that as well, where he talks about. Um, well, he'll do it with foie gras, but he'll also do like like he'll do like four different onion preparations. I think that's kind of cool. Um, you know, things like that. I uh, chicken liver. I've had moose. I've had sautéed livers. I remember my old uh, sous chef made him. He sautéed him something. There was something spicy, and he put a little bit of honey, and that was kind of nice. Uh, kidneys, I haven't enjoyed, but I feel like I haven't had them made right. Uh, Christine said she'd make me uh, them one day. I'm curious to see how she does it because I'm curious, like in Malaysia and Singapore, how they're prepared versus yeah. here. Because you know, again, I'm more familiar with French stuff. Um, when we discuss Bobo, that might be the next video. There's actually lamb tongue with a poached egg. That was really nice. Um, yeah, I've had heart. Heart heart to me doesn't have a terribly distinct flavor. Like it still has an organ flavor, but it's a little tougher. But it tastes sort of some, more similar to beef than some of the other organs do, which kind of makes sense because you figure a lot of these, the meat you're eating, um, the meat you're eating, these are muscles, and the heart itself is a muscle too. So it tastes a little different, but you can still tell it's a similar flavor. Um, I haven't tried brain yet. Let's see what else have I had. Uh, well, I mean, if you've eaten sausage, of course, you've had intestines. I've had tripe. Yeah. We talked about that in Felidia. I like tripe. The one at Felidia was nice. Um, I think that's about it. I'm trying to think. Yeah. yeah. Chicken heart is one of the few things I don't like of the of the material or the organ meats. I, I don't know why. It's just like an odd. Maybe there's a texture of it. It's just not as good as the kidneys. Um, I mean, as the livers. The kidneys. I, I don't know. Does it, the chickens even have kidneys? They probably do, but they're probably just so tiny. But yeah, chicken like, gizzards yeah. is another really amazing one. Chicken gizzards. A lot of good things you can do with it. Mostly fried, but yeah, it's 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 also another good thing. Really interesting texture because it has like the grit kind of. Um, ligament type of stuff and then it has this like some it's not necessarily like a muscle because there's no there's no fibers into it it's kind of just like a solidish meat like but yeah it's it's really interesting meat yeah give yourself a try if you especially if you find them now at restaurants definitely try it out and see how the, the people who are professionals at it are making these things and see if how how often if you working at a place like you can say oh i really like how this was made how often do chefs who are working like be willing to come out and say like, or send a message and say, yeah, this is how I did it. If somebody was interested in finding out. That's a good question. I mean, I'm not really sure actually, I, but this might be something worth looking into because I've never really tested it. I know most places they make a rule to have the, the front of the house staff know how dishes are made. So people can ask, they can answer questions. Like they won't give mm -hmm. you an exact recipe, but they'll say like, Oh, we have the salmon tartare. This is the salmon belly cut up, and we have a spicy mayo. The mayo is made from garlic oil, shallot oil, Thai chili oil, and egg, and then that's folded in. So it's like you have a broad idea of the technique, but they're not going to like give you a recipe yeah. card exactly. Some, I mean, some chefs, I mean, obviously cookbooks like Thomas Keller has one for the French Laundry. He has one for Bouchon. So some of that stuff um, is listed now. I always make the point if you make it at home, it's probably not going to look like it is in those restaurants unless you have the skills. <laughs> yeah, it's a good luck. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, if you, but, but he, but he even makes a good point that there's certain components that are easy to make. Like for example, there's a like head to toe preparation, uh, which is a little hard because you have to be skilled at carving the animal. But then there's like a grabiche sauce, which is based on hard boiled eggs, capers. I think there's onions and stuff like that's easy to make. So then you can make that and serve it with something else. Or like there's a certain sauce that like on a dessert that like might be easy to make, but the presentation of the dessert is hard, but just make the sauce and put it on ice cream like you can do things like that too so you have you know you can enjoy some of it it just won't be at that level uh. all right yeah yeah well that's that's a chicken liver that looks pretty good um it's like something i would enjoy but yeah like i said get out there and try if you're at a restaurant don't just order like lemon chicken every time you go to a restaurant because you can do that at home you've probably had yeah. it it's probably not going to be too different from you making it at home even though some people are just like completely garbage at cooking but it Try try and spread your wings and fly. Spread your wings and okay. <laughs> Speaking about wings, <laughs> well, the next dish is uh, Thai wings with a uh, Thai chili, palm sugar, and toasted garlic. Yeah, these these are good. These are a staple. My girlfriend loves these too. I went he, I went twice with her, and she uh, wanted these the second time. She really enjoyed them the first. So. You can tell the chicken's breaded and fried. It's it's um, the Thai chili. It's the red. Uh, 
chili pepper, small kind of spicy. It's tossed. The sauce I want to say is made of fish sauce. For those people who don't know, that's a, basically Southeast Asia. They take fish, they let it ferment, it breaks down, it gets this very strong, funky fermented flavor. Typically, you will add a little bit of it to flavor things, sort of like soy sauce, because it's so strong, you don't dump a lot of it in. Um, so there's that, plus the palm sugar, that's sugar from coconuts, a little toasted garlic over top, some sesame seeds as well. Um, Again, this speaks to the chef, the Southeast Asian background. He's fond of these ingredients. I think it's really creative. I mean, a lot more interesting than just your standard buffalo wings. Uh, definitely, I've, I've gotten them several times. Like I said, Christine enjoys them too. I, I definitely would recommend these. These. This is one of those dishes that I think has been on the menu since opening or close to it. So I'd highly recommend uh, these if you go there. Yeah, another thing we like doing in these is trying to see, like, okay, uh, at least I start doing, because Stephen has been familiar with this, he works in the food service industry, but things he's told me to kind of notice that normally they'll use certain ingredients in multiple times or certain things to be done in certain different ways. But with this one, this is the only wings dish, if I'm not mistaken, but I guess I think part of it also being a bar is wings are a typical thing to find in a bar. But then instead of them just going like, oh, we're just going to go some basic wings here, they put a little extra into it. That's what I was saying with this place. It's it's doing a different take on just like the bar. Because most bars you'll find wings and it'll be barbecue or like hot. And that's it. Maybe some garlic yeah. parm or something like that might be yeah. in there. But that would be kind of the basic thing. Because instead of these people, they don't even have the barbecue. They don't even have the hot. It's this. So this is kind of the place where I'm thinking it's, it's, it's a good way to just put yourself aside a bit. Yeah, de yeah, definitely. Like I said, I mean, it's just it's a step above average because House of Brews had those standard wings that you're talking about. And it's like, I mean, occasionally they're nice, but it's like I wouldn't come back yeah. to the place. Right. I wouldn't come back. I'm to not going to like regular. them out of the window if you give me wings, but yeah. <laughs> at the same point, like this is this is something good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, not a whole Isn't lot else to say. Not a whole lot else to say. I didn't know if you had any other questions or anything. Yeah, no, it's just like the these really look nice and nice and crispy. Yeah, the wings. And we'd given a chef a tip with the last time with these. Um, if you're making wings at home, uh, one of the good things to do is brine them for a bit, maybe even overnight. It's a good way to soften it. With the chicken, you're not going to lose too much flavor from the meat. Like it's not like you use like some venison or or some more like um, like bison or some kind of really earthy type of like hog where you're where there's a lot of strong taste into it. With chicken, I almost always brine the chicken if I have the time and stuff to do it. And it just adds some softness to it. And of course, you dry it off and you fry it. And with the sauces, try different things with it. You fry it first and then put it in the oven, cover the sauce and things like that. And you can you can find some really, really interesting kind of um, thingamajiggies to do with, it with them. Okay. So now on to the next one. We have a pork belly bao mm -hmm. with apple slaw. Hong Xiao Ru sauce. Sure. So this is the steamed bun. It's a uh, leavened white bread. Um, it's big in Chinese cooking. These are called baozi or bao buns. You make the buns, you usually steam them. You cook them in the steamer, usually a wooden steamer over a stove. Um, different things go inside. People do pork. I've seen beef. I think you can do chicken. Vegetarian versions as well. So Hong Xiao Ru is actually a uh, – it's also called red braised pork belly. It's a um, – Pork belly, usually made with ginger, garlic, spices, chilies, star anise, uh, light and dark soy sauce, and rice wine. So you braise it, you braise it, it cooks down gently. Um, then the sauce, of course, all those flavors come together. It's usually a sweet, sticky sauce. Uh, typically, you just serve that on top of rice with sautéed vegetables, but here they decided to serve it in the buns. Um, the nice, nice touch instead of the for their vegetables, they did a uh, slaw made of red cabbage and apples. Very nice. This is an appetizer, as you can see. It's about a slider size. Usually, get three of them. Um, I mean, I guess you could get get this with a few people. You each have one, or you could. I mean, this wouldn't be enough for a meal unless you got two or three servings. I think. Uh, yeah. Now, with the Chef Nit Up site, uh, I have some different coleslaws in there. And the coleslaw is one of the favorite things. I uh, just like to, like, and we, we we checked, and coleslaw, it turns out to be, as I was mentioning, it's like different things where it has to be. For me, I was thinking it has to be a cabbage or a tough sort of, yeah, cabbage based, and then with a root because of the carrots. But it turns out that it's actually from an old, an old Dutch term, uh, coleslaw. Is it Kulsa? Am I saying this right? Stephen's better on pronunciation of different like languages. I mean, we, 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 
we could ask uh we could ask Kyra because I know like German for cabbage is coal, but it's K it's either well it's either kraut or coal, but coal would be K O H L like the store. And then I think okay. in Dutch it's like coal, it's like similar. But um yeah, I don't know because I don't know it. I know. I mean, in German, you pronounce the W's as V's, but I don't know how they say the W's, so I'd have to. Yeah, we'd have to. Yeah, here, it's it's K K O O L S uh, L A Kulsla. Mm. I think Kulsla. Yeah. Kul it may, it's probably Kohl. It probably said Kohl, and they changed it to Kulsla because some American back in American back in the day was like, and they will say it Kulsla. But okay, so Kulsla. So I guess carrots might have just been the most common thing they could add to it. But we're thinking of different kinds of things. I like normally adding one of the typical things I like adding is, of course, just hot peppers, bell peppers, or chili peppers, like chopping those and adding to them. You can add some different cheese, feather cheese, uh, uh, any kind of cheese you can put to it. Cucumbers is also a common thing that I add to them. When you start going like onions and things like that, kind of gets away from it. But red cabbage, most definitely something that I like switching it in there because it has a lot more of a stronger taste to it. And uh, we'd mentioned this before also, but if you're going to cook with a red salad, if you're going to put anything else in the red salad, it's going to become red. I mean, the red cabbage, like the, the color yeah. of it is a very strong coloration. And we're also talking, it should be purple cabbage instead of red cabbage, because it's really not red. Like mm -hmm. beets are red. Yeah. Um, beets are red. Um, what's the other thing? Um, rhubarb, that's red. I would say red cabbage is more purple than, than anything else. But hey, hey, hey. Okay, now with pork belly, pork belly is, is something that's, in in my estimation, seems to be a lot more popular now in, in the States. Like a lot of cooking is not here, pork belly here, pork belly there, pork belly everywhere. Well, I was going to also add regarding the coloring that there's um, anthocyanin versus anthoxanthin, and that's there's actually different pigments in beets versus, um, beets versus some of the other vegetables. So, for example, uh, like blueberries, purple cabbage, uh, beets that contains anthocyanin, and then cabbage is anthoxanthin. And the difference is that it's a um, it's chemically a different coloring, but also the nutrition that each has. So you're going to get different nutrition from red cabbage versus um, beets, for example. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah, that's why you can get like sugar from beets, but you can't get sugar from. Yeah, but that's probably a different kind of element in it. That's, we're talking yeah. about the food coloring itself. Okay, um, now with pork pork belly. You mentioned this before, and I don't think I've actually looked into it. I didn't ask this question when it came up at the start with a um, eggs Benedict. But what is Canadian bacon? So it's it's basically just a um, it's just a different way of curing. Um, I'm trying to think. It's it's almost it reminds me a little bit more of ham, like the way the texture is. I think it's a different part of. I think it's a different part because typically pork belly is the pork belly is the belly itself and you can see that's why there's sorry bacon is the pork belly itself because if you look at like a pork belly versus bacon that's why the fat sort of like runs through the meat itself mm -hmm. whereas uh canadian bacon it's actually from the pork loin on the back of the pig okay. so because of that that's why like pork loin maybe we can bring up a picture but if you see pork loin it's usually like there's like a slab of meat and then there's like a white fat around the outside whereas pork belly it runs through because the fat runs through the belly so the texture is going to be a lot different and pork loin i mean i think overall is leaner but again the fat's also out the than the outside rather than running through i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure how this came about i mean i know with the italians for example like copa comes from the neck like prosciutto is the leg all this so i think they just figured out Oh, different parts of the meat have different fat content, different texture, and all this. So let's just uh, tweak it, and it gives you a different product accordingly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I seem like I, I prefer bacon. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want team bacon. Bacon. It's bacon. Well, well, bacon, bacon, it, bacon, bacon, bacon. Well, because well, cause you figure too, like they've um, people also compare it to ham because the ham comes from the leg, and then it, the Canadian bacon comes from the loin, so those are both leaner cuts. I mean, obviously, pig's a fatty animal in general, but if you compare mm -hmm. it to the belly, which actually has fat, like, visibly running through it, it's going to be a different product. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a fatty animal. It's a differently bodied animal. You need to be, <laughs> you need to be accepting of different kind of bodies and animals. Why are, you, why are you holding it to your Western human standards of fitness? <laughs> <laughs> Being oppressive. Okay, uh, moving on to the next one. We have some lamb meatballs with um, some yeah. spicy tomato sauce, nduya sausage, and yep. uh, fried garlic and cilantro. Sure. Last time we said this, I said nduja because it was like that's a that's a Nigerian word, <laughs> but it's but it's not. 
Sure. So it's ground lamb. Um, the andouille is actually a sausage from Calabria. They think it's based off the French andouille. That's why, like, the names are somewhat like andouille, andouille. Like, they're sort of similar. Like, you can see maybe, like, the andouille is a bastardization. But um, usually it's a uh, sausage. It's a little funky, a little spicy. Um, that's cut into pieces and mixed in with the lamb. Tomato sauce on the outside, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Fried garlic. Garlic is sliced into chips and then fried. Um there's, they say cilantro. There's actually fennel fronds on top, the top of the fennel, um, the green leaf on top. Uh, it's pretty good. You know, the flavors all work together. So you have the sausage has a little bit of spice. The sauce has a spice. Um, you know, you get the flavor of the lamb. It's not, you know, lamb has a distinct flavor. And then the garlic gives it a little crunch. Yep. Yeah, this nduya is relatively odd of a thing. It's like spreadable type of meat product. Yeah. It's like I look at it and I think Marmite for some reason, even though I haven't really I think I've had Marmite like once or twice. But it's like more like a softer a softer corned beef sort of type of thing. But there'll be a picture on the screen if you watch it. Sort of, yeah. Version. And then it makes sense that it's based off of a French word because like the word J, the letter J isn't there in Italian, so Makes sense that they would have something where it's like, okay, it's based off the French because I think they do use it in French. Yeah, Jean Luc is like with the names of Jay. But yeah, so yeah. it's like about like Jean Luc, but Giancarlo is is not not a Jay. And just think about that. Like it's, it's yeah, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, it's a sausage. We like sausages here. We like meatballs. It's meat, mate, right? Uh, probably in the future, this you can you can eat the bugs. They'll find a way to do like and do yeah, based off of bugs, nice. in, in the near future. But um. Yeah, I mean it's it's three meatballs, <laughs> but this is this again is kind of a typical thing. Like you actually find this kind of thing in certain European cooking where it's not necessarily pasta and meatballs. Have the pasta with some probably pomodoro sauce or something like like something like pasta matriciana, which is like the typical pasta over like the Lazio area, which is like where Rome is. That one's just like mostly tomatoes. It sometimes will have like some sugo, which is like some beef, like kind of really fine minced beef. But normally you normally most of the pastas actually don't have meats in them, like. Even like chicken off, was it fettuccine Alfredo? That's, I. This is a weird thing. I need to double check this. There's like a restaurant in Rome that someone was saying was where fettuccine Alfredo was made. When somebody said it's like an American dish, but like the chicken parmesan with like the chicken bread and chicken on top of it, that's like an American dish. It's not even yeah. a top dish really. So some of these things, but but I, I'm I'm no I have no problem with that. Some people say we got to get the immigrants so we can have their food. Or only people these these are foods of these people. You are what you consume. Part of our interest of getting into this was we just like food. We just like food from different places, understanding the history of it. I have no problem with people taking a certain dish and just freestyling all over it. If the result is good, good for you. If it's poisonous, you're gonna die. <laughs> but, but otherwise, I, I don't think I'm not the kind of guy who's like, it has to be just this. And again, I sent you the I, I sent you the link of it with Jack Allen. I was like, if my grandmother had wheels, she would be a bike. So I, uh, I, I, might put, I might put a clip of that out there. But if you're trying to make something as authentic this, then yes, that's good. But if like this is your take on that, then I'm also open open for that. But yeah. I don't know. Well, I was going to say, I mean, a lot of what Americans think of as Italian is really Italian-American. A lot of that is bastardized Southern food because a lot of People came from the South because the South was poor, so they were seeking better opportunities. So that's why you see all this tomato sauce and like lasagna from Campania, where some of my family actually came from. That's if you picture the foot of Italy, that's like basically the <clears throat> front part of the ankle. That's Campania. Like I said, burrata from Apulia, which is the heel. So that's why a lot of those dishes are popular here because people came here and they couldn't recreate them exactly. So it's okay. We'll mm -hmm. make like a cheaper version of these dishes or whatever. And then those just became popular American dishes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, currently we're listening to black rednecks and white liberals by Tom soul. And he's talking yeah. about how some of that culture, this is one thing that again, people don't take for people take for granted is they look at a oh, white black or uh, this is just British or, Oh, that's just Italian. When, those places to, still to today are very, very diverse places. Like literally somebody who is born and raised in like Turin in Piemonte area can talk to somebody who is born and raised in Sicily and not be, it's, both of them are speaking Italian, but it's essentially a different language because yeah. just the different accents, the, the, the way they say it, the, the words they use and things like that. It's, it's very unique and the foods are very unique. These places, and I think it's, it's tougher for people to really understand, especially people who live in America, because of 
technically how small the place is compared to America. America is just like a rather massive country to begin yeah. with. But even in that kind of small area, it's rather diverse. And a lot of the people who have this mentality also haven't really traveled that much in America. Or they'll go from like Miami to New York to like uh, San Francisco and be like, yeah, I've traveled. It's like, no, that's kind of the same kind of urban areas. Like most of the people you meet in those areas are not even from those areas. But if you just drive a few hours out, there might be some special foods here. There might be some special accents here and things like this. So I think there there is that part where even the culture, even the foods and things like that that were moved on from um, from Europe. I mean, yeah, from Europe early on back in that day are are from certain places, certain languages, certain ways of speaking, certain behavior, even just like the flamboyant kind of gangster type of way. That's how a lot of the <laughs> people who were living in certain areas, the scousers and things like that, <laughs> probably the same kind of <laughs> what the Slavs crouching in. in <laughs> <laughs> Adidas with tracksuits type of things. There's a certain different kind of things and behaviors that were brought by the certain people that were bringing. Because most of the people that were normally chill and doing well in the country that they were in, why would they necessarily leave back in that yeah. day? Now people travel more when they're still doing okay. But back then, it was normally the lower class of the people that were leaving to find better opportunities. So some of those low... And that may be some of why the Europeans look down on some of the things that come from America, because it kind of sprung out from like the lower class of their people from like hundreds of years ago. I don't know. Well, I mentioned, too, when we were talking about Felidia, how we specifically said we're not an Italian restaurant. We feature food from Piemonte, Friuli, and Sicily. And part of that is because Lydia's family came from the north. The chef was from Sicily, though. So it's like, you know, so in the north, risotto was more common. In the south, with pasta was more common. I mean, obviously, that changed over time. In the south, you see a lot more tomatoes and peppers. You see a lot more calamari and things. In the north, you see more olives. I mean, this olives you see in the South too. I mean, obviously these things aren't set in stone. They've changed over time because crisscross ideas exchanged. But as you said, the people who came from Italy were mostly, they were poor and they were people from the South. So that's why Italian food is the way it is. And then risotto and other things from the North came over later. But I think that's a combination of, okay, people either who were in the North and weren't doing as well, or people who just had better opportunities in America or something. So then that's when you started seeing risottos, some of these cured meats and cheeses, that's when they started making their way into America. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and another big uh, venue of cuisine that's been very Americanized is, uh, of course, Asian food. Like Chinese yeah. food, my favorite Chinese food is completely Americanized. The Chinese don't even say that they made yeah. it there. The General Tso's chicken is my favorite thing to order. And yeah. it's, there's so many different ways you can make that. But that is definitely like a unique one, because when I got to Italy and I was, okay, finally going to now like full on just Chinese restaurant with fresher ingredients from different places. I think it was more like, I wasn't even a Szechuan place, but not from the different regions because again, China is a massive place. So this was like, oh wow, this is a whole different kind of taste flavor palette that you don't really find with like, even when you go to Chinese restaurants, they, they have like very big menus, but it's like the same thing at all places. And I think they've gotten to the point where it's like, we're just going to make these things in this Americanized version. That's not, it's not bad food, but it's just not Chinese food. Well, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was Chinese food, but it's not food from China. I had, well, I, it was funny because I had a uh, roommate from Taiwan at culinary school. He was among the, I had a series of roommates in the first year I lived in a um, three person room. So I had these two roommates and they left to go to externship and these other two guys moved in. Second round, uh, one of the guys was from Taiwan and he made the comment to me. He goes, he goes, I've noticed our fast food is popular here. It's like, that's essentially yeah. how they view like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's like high dining. It's like, oh, when somebody doesn't feel like fast food, they go to Chinese when they still want something rather quick. Yeah, it's like yeah. typical type of thing, but yeah. Oh yeah, I guess the next one, we're still in Asia here for the next one. And this one's uh -huh. like, oh, this? back, baby, back, baby, back, chilies, baby, back, waves. Oh, is this chili still open? Uh, maybe, I don't know. I haven't tried to go to one in a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm surprised I haven't done a, like a, an update of Austin Powers' movie, though. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're, they're working on, there's some people talking on that. Some of the things are good to be left. But anyway, uh -huh. these are baby, back, ribs, Korean barbecue sauce, and Asian coleslaw. Sure. So as I mentioned last time, I'm not exactly sure what makes it Korean. I mean, guess get, judging by the flavors, it's probably based. There's probably soy sauce, sugar, um, rice wine, vinegar. Uh, I could taste some star anise and peppercorns in it. So, you know, something sugary that roasts well and that you can, um, well, you can braise it in, but it also roasts well. So the outside will get crispy. Um Asian coleslaw, as you see, it's your red cabbage. Again, probably sesame oil as well as sesame seeds on top. Notice there's both black and white sesame. Um, a little bit of cilantro as well. That's big in um, Asian, well, especially Southeast Asian as well as um, 
Latin American cooking. And then, yeah, these are very tender. Again, it reminds me a lot of the Chinese five spice powder. Those who don't know, that's usually like star anise, clove, peppercorn, ginger. There's like one other thing. It's one of those things that's not set in stone, though. It's like curry. It kind of changes, you know, family mm -hmm. by family. Like it gets tweaked a little, but um, it reminds me of that. Um, it's a nice dish, though. I've had this a bunch of times here. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly can't go wrong with ribs in general. Just that bone meat is going to be succulent. And then, of course, the red cabbage again. This one looks more like a pickled red cabbage, not rather than cooked. Yeah, it's um, my sense. Like I say, there's probably rice vinegar and other things, and that's probably that's probably what they probably well, a bit sits of like in the that. kimchi type of thing with it. So maybe they're saying that's like this a bit Korean-ish. Well, well, well. The thing is, though, I always point out kimchi is fermented though, because kimchi you add spices to it and then historically they bury it in a jar under the earth but now you have refrigerators that like keep mm -hmm. it at a certain temperature and it basically just ferments but it's in a controlled environment there's also a certain culture you put in new which actually is what causes it to ferment and that's kind of what gives it the flavor and it ferments in a way that okay. the flavor changes and stuff and you can still eat it and the thing is too a lot of people forget that um or people don't know that historically that's what sauerkraut was too sauerkraut was fermented yeah. cabbage it's just what a lot of what we have today is pickled cabbage where they just shred cabbage, they dump vinegar over it, and that's that. But originally it was you added a certain culture. I think it was lactic acid, like from dairy and other things, and you just let it sit. It would basically ferment, bubble all this, and then that was cabbage. That was a sauerkraut. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, off to the ribs. Now we're going to the next one. Yeah, this is one of the exciting – I mean, there's a lot of exciting dishes here, but this yeah. is it's another really good one. Cornbread crusted calamari with lime sriracha, sriracha aioli, and mango mango salsa and queso fresco. Sure. This this used to be on the menu closer when they opened. I was disappointed they took it off. It was a really nice dish, one of those things I actually had a few times. I was saying I, I like this dish a lot because everyone else just does like plain calamari with like marinara or whatever. It's like really boring. This was actually creative though. So for those who don't know, sriracha sauce, it's a, I mean, I, it's so popular, I think most people know, but basically it's a its a hot chili sauce made from chili peppers, vinegar, garlic, sugar, salt. Um, very popular in Southeast Asia, especially, um, Th one say it was, some say it was Thailand, but of course there's debate about like where did it come from and all that. Um, I, I like sriracha. I think it's one of those things that's good in limited amounts. So I was saying, I think it's become one of those things that people kind of overuse, like everyone just started putting sriracha in everything. And it's just like, what's the point? Everything tastes like sriracha. But I thought the sauce here was good because it was aioli. For those people who don't know, it's similar to mayo, but instead of uh, canola oil, you use olive oil. And there's also the addition of garlic. Historically, too, it was made in a mortar and pestle. But I mean, you know, nobody <laughs> does that anymore. And so it was garlic, olive oil, egg yolk. Egg yolk is the emulsifier. You add a little bit of lime as well as the sriracha. That's what gives it the color and flavor. Mango salsa, it's fresh mango salsa. Um, put on top at the end, It's there, there were, I want to say, peppers in there, maybe a little onion, so it's like sweet and a little spicy. Um, then queso fresco, fresco is a, uh, means literally fresh cheese. Started in Spain, big in Mexico and other places as well. It's like a soft, crumbly uh, cow cheese. Um, I think what they do is they fry the calamari and they kind of put the stuff on last minute so it doesn't get soggy. And then, mm. you know, you have the different flavors. You have the spice of the sriracha. You have lime. Uh, Mango is a little sweet but still a little spicy. And then the fresh cheese on top. Really, really nice dish, actually. Probably yeah. uh, probably one of the most interesting calamari dishes I've had in some time, like as far as fried calamari goes. Uh. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You know, and that's just a simple change. Instead of just using the wheat-based uh, coat, uh, coating for the, for the uh, thing, you just use – Corn, you just use corn based flour. That's just, it seems like such a simple change, but then it can add so much different flavor and so much different change on the whole like actual dish. And uh, we also talked about uh, with calamari, which is squid, of course. Um, it's something that y'all should definitely try cooking with. Like, I find it to be very, very flexible dish. They have, of course, the arms, and then they have like the hood where you can cut that for those rings kind of things. And I like having them just like steamed or fried or deep fried like this in different kinds of ways. You can put them in salad. You can put them, of course, as the main dish. You can even just have it by itself. If you get a big enough hood, you can even have like a calamari steak of sorts. So it's it's rather flexible, takes different flavor. And you'd mentioned the, the cooking about it. Well, tell us a bit about the thing you'd mentioned with like when you're actually cooking with it. It's a bit tricky, but once you figure it out, it's it's very good. Well, it, it's kind of a, it's a funny thing because the cephalopods in general, that's octopus, squid, cuttlefish. It's this weird like it, you either have to do very high temperature very quickly or low in a long period of time. And there's this weird thing where you cook it like 
it gets tough initially, then it gets tender, but if you overcook it, it gets tough again. But when it gets tough again, like you can't go back and make it tender again, so you have to get it exactly right. Um, Gordon Ramsay in one of his cookbooks, he has a very exact science to it. Like he he has calamari that one of his cooks made. He said these were fried fried five seconds too long or something. Like he has it down <laughs> to an exact science. Like, okay, you throw it in this long, pull it out exactly, and then um, you know, it's like it's perfectly tender. But it's one of those things I think if you either have a really good recipe or you just do it enough, you know exactly, okay, pull it out. It'll carry over this much and then it'll be tender, but it won't go over. Um, and the, you know, this, this calamari was always tender. Um, some places overcook it a little. I've had it. I, I haven't had it like really, really overdone in a while. I mean, I think like, Maybe like cheaper places, yeah, but it's like I think most people at this point know how to cook it pretty well. Uh. Yeah, yeah, and that's it with the calamari dish. This is one of the, like uh, Stephen has said. This is one of the more exciting takes on calamari that I've seen because it's. I think it's already it's odd enough. It's off enough for most people that just having calamari, they'll just do okay. We're just gonna do it like fried with batter and just have it on the side, maybe with some limes and some dipping butter or something. That's it. Like, yeah. You know, we just put yeah. it that way, and it's it's still good that way because it's still squid, but. This is just an interesting way to add to it. Like here, you can have the entire dish just be that. And yeah, it's 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 good. But again, this is a bar restaurant. It's not just a restaurant that they're going to this level of of um, of culinary uh, insight. It's, it's 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 impressive. Well, it's kind of like what I was saying before about like the plain standard wings. Like if someone made them for me, I'd eat them. But I'm not gonna like go to a place and just get plain calamari with marinara sauce. It's like yeah. I've had that a billion times, and I can make it myself. What's the point? You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, now on to the next one. I hear again we're talking about something relatively simple and putting a bit of a different change on it. And it's some truffle mac and cheese with calatapi fontina cheese sauce. Sure. So this pasta here is cavatappi. It means corkscrew in Italian. You can probably tell by the spiral shape. Like if you were to cut it into pieces, it would look more like macaroni, but it's made in that shape, so it's a little longer. Um the truffle, I think they used truffle oil. I didn't, uh, there were no pieces of actual truffle. I mean, it still tasted and smelled nice. Um, so Fontina cheese is a cow's milk cheese that originated from, um, it's from Italy. Oh, it's the Alsta region. It's the Alpine region, Northwest Italy. Um, so it's raw cow's milk, semi-soft, young. Uh, if you age it, it gets firmer. Um, that was, that was, cheese was made into this sauce as you can see it runs out into the bottom and there's a little bit on top that melts over the top uh you could get this with bacon too my girlfriend didn't want bacon so we didn't i was like oh well i'll come back another time and get it with bacon uh decent decent dish though it was a cold day as well so it's nice cold weather food although that's changing soon so yeah because the climate is changing <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so this is the school. And again, it's another one of those cool kind of dishes type of serving thing. You can see here it's on the cast iron. So, of course, they didn't cook it on the cast iron because it would be dropping over. So they probably made it in a pot and then put it in the cast iron. Maybe just the last minute put it in the cast iron and drip the sauce over, then throw it in the oven, right? That's why you said there was like, yeah. you can see some of the little uh, browning of the cheese and things like that. So yep. it's, it's nice. The crispiness out there with a bit of a crispiness, then you have the stringiness of the cheese. Then you have the, the the double kind of corkscrew thing, and then of course this cheese sauce. So you can see different mouthfeels that you're gonna have in a dish like this, and it's rather straightforward. It's still just mac and cheese, but yeah. it's not just mac and cheese. Yeah. There was one I liked mac a lot at the. There was one I liked a lot about the 8th Street wine cellar. I'm trying to remember what they used, but they actually put mozzarella in it, and you could get it with uh, kielbasa, which was nice. You know, hmm. of course. Polish guy likes kielbasa, and um, but with mozzarella is nice. I mean, I love mozzarella, so I thought it was nice. Um, you know, breadcrumbs on top, and it was toasted. I don't think I have any photos of that. I'd have to go back and look though. Oh. All right, we can find some. Okay, now on to the next one. Here we have some grilled octopus, peperonata, lemon aioli, and uh, castelvetrano olives. Sure. So Sure. So, um, peperonata is a uh, pepper stew. There's usually um, peppers. It's a little sweeter. There's a little bit of vinegar in there, typically too, as well. Um, like we say, the octopus is grilled. Uh, lemon aioli. So it's it's a garlic olive oil based. A little bit of lemon thrown in as well, although it's not overly prominent. And Costal de Toronto olives are olives from Sicily. I want to say that's. Uh, that's the name. That's the name of the type of olive. There's a town called Trapani. That's where Trapanese pesto comes from. Uh, pa Trapanese pesto is the one. It's like Genovese was. Uh, let's see, basil, pine nuts, olive oil, and garlic, and then some cheese. But the um, the one from Trapani is instead of uh, 
basil, it's actually peppers. So Trapani is near there, and I want to say I think these olives come from nearby. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Again, olives. It's like no olives. Olives off of everything. I even pick olives off the pizza, but the the flavor is already infused itself into it. But still, I'll, I'll pick them off if somebody has ordered them with them, and it's the only pizza there. It's olives and truffles are, are two of the no go things for me. And as I mentioned before, it's like it's like ladyfinger or okra okra it's a kind of okra type of thing even okra itself it has that slimy kind of mouth yeah. i don't like stuff like that um so of course that goes to gorgonzola cheese it's not that it's um, it's yeah there's some things i'm just like nah nah mm -hmm. nah like that little girl who, who, who nah nah <laughs> did he draw on my face <laughs> it's a little girl from manchester i don't know if y'all have seen that little clip with the <laughs> with the elf from the shelf thing it's it's a, it's a lovely little girl okay um now was, we turned to wonder i was I, I did look for this if you can eat because you the hood of the of the calamari is where you get those uh the, the rings yeah. And you, of course, you can eat the arms. And the arms, of course, a lot thinner. Now, of course, you something you might end up. But in squids, they're a lot thinner than now. And octopus, octopus have more beefy arms and things like that. So most of the octopus you'll see is the arms. But I'm trying to look and see, like, can you look at the tentacles or what are started? But I'm trying to see if you can, if there's enough of the hood or the head area where you can actually eat. I'm trying to just zoom around and see. But most of the times when you get octopus, you will be eating the arms. I don't think you'll find the head really being served at many places if it's if it's okay. So yeah, I'm cooking a two it's, kilogram. Go ahead. It's like it's like with scallop. Like a lot of people forget that the scallop that you're eating is actually the adductor muscle that opens and closes mm -hmm. the shell. That's not the whole scallop. There's also a belly, but the belly is soft, has a briny flavor. It doesn't agree with everyone. I think it's good personally, but like if you have if you have like clam strips versus uh, fried whole clams, you'll taste the difference because the clam strips are the clam adductor muscle pulled apart. And then the cl whole clam is the belly. It's the whole round thing inside. But again, it has a stronger briny or flavor, which everyone doesn't, it doesn't agree with everyone. So I know for certain chefs, they'll use the belly for other things like Thomas Keller as a scallop belly soup. Um, that's another, you know, thing item that gets wasted. People just don't want to mess with it. So they just throw it away and use the rest. So. Mm. Yeah, so I checked here, and you can use the, the you can use it, but also with with squid cephalopods in general, um, when you cook them, they'll lose a lot of their actual size. They have water and some salt in them and things like that. But yeah, you can cook the head the head area, but of course you have to remove the insides and the beak and things like that. But, but otherwise, you can. It's just you probably won't. I guess you can find fresh octopus in places. But this is one thing I was suggesting. I know there's different prices coming with inflation and things like this. Some things are harder to get for some people, but a lot of people have been limited by thinking, I, this is what I eat. This is the only thing I eat. When in current timeline, if you're listening to this, you probably live in a place where you have access to a lot more different things that you might not have tried yet. Maybe if you live by the coast, even if you don't live by the coast, there might be some up and coming startup that's shipping fresh seafood to places or you can get these. I think there's now companies where you can sign up as a part of like a membership type of thing where you get different foods and discounts and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Expand your palate and trying to test out different things. And I think you'll be you'll be pleasantly surprised with the goodness that's that's there to be had. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So now moving on to the next one, you'd mentioned the scallops and we've talked about this before. I wish you could just get like a giant clam and get that abductor muscle from it so you can get a massive scallop steak. And here you have some pan seared scallops with chorizo and uh, sweet corn tomatoes. Yeah, this was on the... This was on the menu last summer. You could probably tell by tomatoes and corn. That's a big summertime thing. I want to say the sauce was a beurre blanc. Beurre blanc means white butter in French. Basically, it's a reduction of white wine, usually peppercorns, herbs, and other things. You reduce the wine. It gets thick, almost like a syrup. You strain what the aromatics out of it. You finish it with butter, so it's this um, sort of like whitish, thickened sauce. Um my sense is that's that's what they did for the sauce here, although I didn't write it down. Um, chorizo is sautéed along with the corn and some uh, herbs here. Uh, also, there's red and yellow, I want to say cherry tomatoes, and then some um, Thai chili pepper on top. Really nice dish. We were saying last time, like, I don't know if I would call this surf and turf, although it's kind of playing the, with those themes, but I think it was really nice, mm -hmm. the chorizo uh, paired with the scallops, because chorizo, it's a... Um, it's a sausage. It's in the different Spanish countries. I mean, they have it Spain, Mexico, Colombia, all that. Each version varies a little bit, uh, spice blend and all that. Sometimes vegetables are added. Um, Mexican one is popular. I like it a lot. It has star anise and other things. So it was nice. And then the scallops themselves are a little more delicate, so they work well together. 
Yeah, and I also think it was a dish like this. They've gotten, I mean, the scallops is small and compact. The sausage is kind of like a contained cylindrical type of thing, but then you have the cherry tomatoes. Sweet corn is also kind of small little kernels of things. Yeah. So everything's kind of like small. You've you've made some character out of all these small, self-contained type of things instead of having, you know, so you, you maybe have a big steak and you have these small things. Okay, why are these self-contained? So maybe it, it adds, it lessens the disappointment of not having a massive scallop because scallops are so good, but you just normally have these tiny little morsels. So it's kind of something playing together with, different kinds of foods and different similar kind of containers containment of goodness and small things but yeah i love cooking chorizo with uh eggs we did that a lot at culinary school because if you've ever worked with chorizo mm -hmm. um when you render it out the fat that bleeds out is reddish because it's stained by the spices notably paprika yeah. and then if you cook eggs and that the eggs turn this orange color which is kind of cool huh. yeah I, the typical the regular thing i put in scrambled eggs is like turmeric and that also turns them really bright bright yellow and things like that but yeah, most of the yolks here have a lot more yellow. I don't know, was it yellow or yolks here in Kenya? Yeah, some of the yolks here are like blood red, whereas in America you don't really find those that much. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like I feel like we looked that up at one point. Didn't it have something to do with the nutrition that the chickens yeah. get or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, so moving on to the next one, talking about chickens. Talking about the nutrition they have, and this is a yard bird. Yard bird. The yard bird, a fried chicken, pimento cheese, bacon, buffalo ranch, and pickled chilies. Sure. So this is the sandwich. It's on the lunch and brunch menu. I had it for lunch one day. Uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, fried chicken, you know, they have their own spice blend. Pimento cheese, it's a cheese, uh, similar American cheese, basically, but the spicy peppers in. Bacon, I think self-explanatory. Buffalo ranch, again, same thing. Uh Ranch flavored a little buffalo seasoning, so it's spicy, and then pickled chilies on top. Uh, baby arugula on the bottom as well. It's served on a brioche bun. So you got a few different things here. You have the um, spiciness, but also creaminess from the cheese. You have the saltiness and crunch of the bacon. The greens add a little bit of crunch as well, a little bit of tomato, and then the ranch. The ranch is a little spicy too, but um, but because it's ranch, it, it's it's mellowed out a little bit by the um, the nature of it. Yeah. Yeah, and with this, we just want to—I want to reiterate this. I had a good discussion about this. Stop using iceberg lettuce on your burgers. I know when you go to like <laughs> a fast food place, that's the typical thing they give you. But as Stephen said, it's just—it's—it's it's crispy water. That's pretty yeah, much all it yeah. is. So I, I like using different kinds of things, Swiss chard, uh, rocket lettuce, arugula here. You would have different, stronger kind of flavors to kind of work as. But is there something with burgers where you're supposed to put the greens above or below? What's the kind of uh, etiquette with that or organize it or just whatever you want to put it? I don't know that there's particular etiquette. I would just make the point, kind of put it on last minute, because the thing is, remember, as the burger is hot and the greens are mm -hmm. delicate, if you let them sit and sit and sit, it'll kill the greens. And the idea is that... Someone made the point, I mean, I think even when I was a kid, someone pointed out that the fresh burgers, you know, because the meat is hot, but then the lettuce is still cool, a little cool and crunchy yeah. and you bite into that. Whereas if it sits and sits and sits, the lettuce will actually get soggy because it's just, it's being cooked by the burger, essentially. Um, so you have to play that carefully. Now, I'd mentioned how in the DB uh, Bistro Burger, he actually uses frisé, which is interesting because frisé is a bitter green, but frisé is also pretty hearty. So even if it were to sit on the bun itself, it would hold up, but you bite into it and you get... The yeah. meat itself, but then you also get the tomato jam, and you get a little bit of the bitterness from the greens, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. no, this is good. I mean, it's the burgers. Definitely check out the burger uh, episode that we had. That we just yeah. went to like uh, in eight or nine different burgers. It was more than that. I think it was like twelve burgers at different places Probably. he's been to. Will he's been eating some other burgers as well, so we might come back with a different specific burger ones. Uh, there might be other things we might do like specific food wise ones, but so far not not quite. Well, this one, of course, we'll have a specific cocktail one once we're done with this. And I don't know, um, let's go to one more and this is one more bird. I mean, we've left the chicken here. The chicken is a kind of star bird, but let's go to another another secondary bird that's relatively common. I mean, you probably, some people might have had heard it, had it, but you've heard of it being served. And here we're going to go with quail with wild rice and tournade vegetables. Yeah, so it's a quail, for those that don't know, it's a very small, delicate bird. This is mostly white Ooh, meat. Bird. Uh, yeah, a little, probably the smallest one you eat, to be honest, now that I think of it. I mean, not not a lot of meat on this. This is either 
an entree in which they give you more than one or they um or they'll give it as an appetizer but they'll only give one um this one you can see here it's seared that's why it's brown on the outside wild rice it's like a peel off that's underneath tournay for those who don't know tournay comes from the french it's the conjugated version of the infinitive tournay which is t-o-u-r-n-e-r -E uh it means to turn so the idea is Maybe we can find a diagram or something, but when you're fabricating these vegetables, you're taking a paring knife and going like this, like you're rotating in your hand as you're slicing it down. And the idea is you're carving off little bits, so when it's combined, it looks almost like a football, but with multiple angles. It's an old school technique, but a lot of places still do it. Like Barbaloon, my first job here, um, we did it for apples that went on the Boudin Blanc, the sausage dish, so that was kind of nice. Some people still do it. Uh, some people do it with carrots. Here it was done with... Um, zucchini i want to say both uh yellow and green there's also some um i think there was pearl onion here as well and then on top you see some fennel fronds and i try to remember if that was chrysanthemum i forget what the leaf is i i should know i've seen it a lot but i can't remember uh. yeah again what's what's that term again i keep forget i keep forgetting uh when you do like the yogurt or frozen yogurt or ice cream when you little like circular type of thing canal Canal, yeah. So this is like this is like canal with like vegetables. Yeah. It's kind of oh, I see the interesting tournay knife kind of. It's like a beak, little hook type of thing. And we'll have it on the screen. There's a site here that says how to tournay. I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt these. I'm gonna attempt this yeah. because I, I I'm pretty good, decent at cooking. Like the flavors are good, but I'm not really too good at presentation, like plating things. So I think trying out some of these things might help me step my game up a bit with like the the way to present different things in different ways. But yeah. Yeah, this is one of those things that we uh, learn in school. It's funny. It's like one of those things they teach you, but then like you barely use it in the real world unless you do a <laughs> yeah, unless you work in like an old school French place. There's also a uh, preparation called fluting a mushroom. That's really old school. That goes back to like Escoffier's time, like 1800s. Um, maybe we can put up a picture of that as well. But basically. It's, it's in a similar vein where what you do is you take a mushroom, you peel off the skin on the outside, and you sort of cut these ridges into it. But it's a similar thing where you have to turn it and slice ridges into it as you're turning it. And then it makes this nice little uh, spiral design. And in school, I knew some people who did that. Like, for example, um, one of my friends, he had this old – one of our old school friend chefs as an instructor, and he taught the class how to do it. And then they served a uh, mushroom dish, and they put fluted mushrooms on, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um but again, it's like I haven't I haven't really seen this in restaurants. I mean, I don't know, maybe someone somewhere still does it, but this is like a really old school thing. Yeah, yeah I've seen something like in is also in uh, you know the Japanese when they do the little hot pots and things like that. Uh, yeah. I I think this was in a manga or in an anime. But there's a lot of things with manga and anime. They do a lot of different food. There's a lot of food into it. But this is also something that's in some. Uh, western writing not so much in western comic books although i think some of the more recent ones are going towards more like manga type stuff where they have like entire types of just like in a restaurant but anyway so short digression but yeah they have something where you know the the cremity mushrooms the brown ones yeah the, the, or or the portobello ones the kind of bigger ones where they kind of do this they cut like a like a cross, hot cross burn type of thing and they peel off so it's kind of like different kind of designs and you put it in but it's it's not necessarily the same it's definitely not the same as the food thing i see the food thing here is kind of really cool type of thing i'm wondering yeah. like, what's what are they is it just for the looks or is it like some the flavor gets in somehow or it's just kind of a, a thing that they just develop it's, it's it's just an aesthetic appeal and it's a skill i mean like i say old school um it goes way back to to, I want to say Escoffier's time, so that's like 1800s. Um, I don't think many people do it anymore. I mean, it's impressive if you can, but it's like, I don't know, it's just it's one of those things that just went out of style, I suppose. It looks like a, kind of like a meringue, like uh, is it a meringue with those kind of circular type of things, like little poofs that you only find in cakes or something? Or like yeah, the meringue, mer yeah. meringue crisps, yeah. 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 All right, so yeah, I think uh, we're going to end here for now. This is yeah. uh, about an hour and a half, so uh, now our beautiful faces are back on the screen, but yeah, like this is this was good. This is it's good to get back into this one. As we've mentioned, uh, there is at least nine other restaurants out there that we've done, and seasonal had five five of them had five different sections. Yeah, and uh, a few of them only had one part, but most of them have at least two parts. So there's a lot of content out there if you like this food stuff in specific. 
Uh, you can follow Stephen and see some extreme assist content as well with <laughs> a lot of good food that he has there. And then I also have the chef in it up uh, that carbon33.com maybe i'll get the chef and top name later but uh, you can find some food there we're talking with Stephen about getting more like our food stuff focused in one location so whenever that happens i might update the links here but for now you can definitely go to chef and top carbon 33.com and whatever even if this goes away even if we find different source you'll be able to find a link to that primary source where we have all our food stuff from that site there and uh, otherwise, I don't know, what, what's any other takes with Dolly Varden? Like, it's interesting because, like you said, a lot of different places have closed. And you were telling us a bit, like, there's a few restaurants, like we did, like DB Bistro, that's still not open. So what, what do you, what's your estimation? With, what's the, what's the uh, New York restaurant landscape looking like now that we're finally coming out of this? Now that uh, whatever's happening with that Russian guy has ended the thing that might have come from that Chinese lab. And now that things are opening up again, what's what's it looking like in the food service industry in New York? I, feel, I mean, I feel like things are returning back to normal. I think I was even saying this to one of our friends yesterday, like, you know, like as much as I complain about it, people here have been hysterical. Aside from some people wearing masks, I don't feel like, I feel like we're getting out of it. Like it's certain places will wear masks, like the staff will wear masks, but that's more because they're trying to give off the impression that the place is safe or whatever. But I mean, I see fewer and fewer people on the streets wearing masks. I mean, people are still out and about, people still hanging out. So it's like, I feel like we're coming back to normal, especially with spring around the corner. I mean, some of the flowers are coming up already. So I, um, I don't know what the general opinion overall is, but I think most a lot of a lot of the fear is gone. So I think because that people are eating out and about again, I think some places are opening. Like I saw where Netta used to be, it looks like there's a new place that's trying to open. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still don't know what's going on with DB. Like I think I mentioned, it just says temporarily closed, but they've said that for like two years, and um, you know they haven't gave made any announcements. Uh, there's a new place actually opening where Felidia was. I think it's a Korean place, so I'm curious what will happen with that. Um, I'm not yeah, I think there's a few other places that are still open. There's still there's still empty storefronts, of course, but I mean I think as things return to normal, people will probably buy them up and start over. I think where Bar Bacon was, it looked like they were trying to reopen that too. So um, you know, I think things are looking up overall. Yeah. All right. So as usual, we normally ask in this. Uh, thanks, of course, to Stephen for taking the time to take these pictures. Of course, he's eating <laughs> and he does the extra taking the time to take the pictures and come share some of the knowledge with it. If there's any restaurants that y'all have been to while being in New York or if you're in New York and you have been to certain places and you want Stephen to check those places out, let us know. Maybe in our back catalog of the places he's been to, he's open to taking some suggestions. And yeah, keep your eye out, Stephen. Like, I'll be interested to see some of these newer places. He has a lot of places that he's been to already that he's taken pictures of that we have coming up in the series. And there's places he's been thinking about going to as well. So uh, that's, that's the thing. Maybe in the future, we'll have some meetups where you can find Stephen and you can find some food. We're, we'll, we'll, we'll get that once we actually get to know y'all. We're not just going to be meeting randos <laughs> at mm. different places, even if it's a public place. I don't know. We'll see about that. But yeah, um, anything else you want to say about Dolly Varden? Uh, not a whole lot else. Like I said, my one criticism is the menu hasn't changed in a bit, but I think that had to do with the staffing issues I mentioned. Um, the one lady was talking about doing new spring-related cocktails, so I think once this new round of staff gets settled in, they'll probably start tweaking things, and I think that'll be good because then, you know, you have... I've always said, I think with restaurants, you need to keep certain staples around that people come back regularly for, but you also need to do new stuff. Cause again, it's like, if the menu stays identical for a year or more, I'm not going to keep coming back and eating the same stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So there we have it. Uh, guys, gals, and everyone else in between. Thank you all very much for listening. This has been Dish You on Dish, part one of Dolly Varden, at least one more part of the food coming and then a separate one for cocktails. Yep. Thank That's you all. That's it for me. Goodbye. Goodbye.